he would pack it up, we'd vacuum seal everything and wrap it all in bubble tape and then ship, ship 100 vials at a time. I was dropping off some shipments and somebody was taking pictures of me. The cops are watching. I started thinking like, I can do this. Like I, I, could, I can compete with these guys. I can undercut everybody. <laughs> Hey, this is Matt Cox, and I am here with Ryan Root. Ryan is the largest convicted steroid dealer in the United States. Mm-hmm. Are we going with the United States? No. U- U.S. Oh. history. U.S. Mm-hmm. history. Mm-hmm. U.S. history. Mm-hmm. And we're going to be doing an interview. And uh, so this is Ryan. And so let's mm-hmm. uh, let's you know. Right. Yeah. I appreciate uh, you coming. I appreciate you coming here, and I know you know it was a it was a drive and a and a flight yeah. and, and everything else. And yeah. and uh, you also did Danny's on you know Concrete's you know mm-hmm. podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, and Danny called me and said like, bro, you gotta. When he mm-hmm. called me, he sent me a text. He's like, bro, mm-hmm. you gotta you gotta talk to this guy. Mm-hmm. Um, I, w- I want to thank you too for uh for for having me on and for yeah. um for doing what you do. It's uh you know you provide a lot of. Uh, value and entertainment for a lot of people. And oh, I appreciate that. We appreciate that. Um, and he uh, actually called me. He, like I said, he sent me a uh, Ryan sent me a an email which I apparently didn't respond to. So I'm kind of a dick, but that's fine. It's fine. It worked out. So let's start with. I mean, you know, I'll start from the beginning. Like, um, you know, you were uh, you were born in New York, <coughs> or where were you? Yeah, yeah. So I was born in New York. Uh, um, I guess the the story starts when I was younger. I I was underdeveloped and mature. Um, I, I did not grow like the rest of my peers. I, I was very skinny and small. And then uh, there came a point where I started getting picked on for being so small and skinny. So I started hitting the gym and then I never looked back at probably about 13. I, I started uh, just really hitting the gym and never looked back. But I still was working harder than everybody else and I still wouldn't develop like everybody else. Um, anybody who around me who put in half the effort that I did seemed to get twice the results. So what, was there, is there a specific reason or I just, yeah, it, well now it's evident, you know, now looking back that I've had low testosterone my, my entire life. Okay. Um, you know, even as, as a younger, um, and it, it, yeah, it adversely affected me in the way that, so, so, you know, because of this issue, I had confidence problems. Um, I always, I always needed everybody to, uh, accept me and like me. So, I tended to get walked down a lot. Right. Um, nobody noticed me. Like I didn't, you know, I didn't really stick out. It wasn't, uh, you know, uh, it was just kind of under, again, underdeveloped. And uh, so at 23, I started taking testosterone. I took a um, a very mild cycle at the time, which was Sustanon, which is a blend of testosterone and um, 10 milligrams of D-ball is all which is very mild <laughs> a lot of people may not know what that is but it's a very mild uh, cycle and yeah. i hyper responded i absolutely i blew up i my i changed dramatically um i put on 30 pounds um of positive of quality weight i oh, put 100 wow. pounds on my bench in about five weeks how long did you put the 30 pounds on five, five weeks. weeks oh it's in five weeks in five you, weeks i put yeah. on 30 pounds of quality muscle and I hyper responded. Now, right. most people don't react like that, but it's also a testament to how low my testosterone must have been right. prior to that because I, I responded, you know, incredibly. And, you know, there's a lot of people saying you can't put on 30 pounds in five weeks, and I did. All right. <clears throat> but it's also a testament to why it drove so much passion. So now I'm, uh, I'm you know, now I, I actually look like all the work, the work that I put in. I, right. I, I'm representative of my work ethic. So... I'm bigger than everybody else. Uh, I'm, you know, I look impressive. My muscles all formed, and I had perfect striations. And um, and now I'm getting more confident. And now people are starting to notice me. Now everybody wants to befriend me. Right. Um, I walk into a bar and heads turn, and I notice everybody parts out of my way when I, you know, as I'm walking right. to the bar. Like I would bump into somebody by accident, and they would turn, look at me, see my impressive stature, and then. And then apologize to me. Right. Um, it's just life turns. So uh, while I was in college, I was a plumber. Um, I, I worked for my brother-in-law's plumbing company. I hated it. I hated the job. I wasn't good at it. I wasn't even trying to be good at it. But as soon as I started taking steroids for no better reason than I stood before him looking stout, he gave me a raise. Right. 
<laughs> life just changes in this way when yeah yeah you know and it has to do with you know now that i'm getting noticed and having my, my confidence has increased uh people are looking at me more and it just changes changes your life dramatically so i live two different worlds one before testosterone and and one after and the life after i vastly prefer the life of testosterone it's absolutely dramatically improved so um so that drove a passion right. so at the time i was in college for biochemistry um, I started tailoring my degree towards testosterone, or the study of hormones and how they affect the human body. Were you already interested in, in, uh, in uh, you know, biochemistry prior to uh, the testosterone, just yeah, in general? I, yeah, I was in which, school for it. Okay, but but now that I don't I, know if it maybe it maybe that the results swayed you to, toward that. It 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 didn't. I was already in. I had already gone to school for that. However. Um, it did make me adjust my the classes I took right. because I, I had a lot of you have a lot of elective classes you can take right and I I did adjust them towards everything that would represent hormones and how they affect the body and you know everything that that I know today is is based on um, the classes that I took but then so then also what it drove is just a, a, a passion that made me research uh, voraciously just research every day I was looking up and, and reading, and, and I, I just learned everything there was about these hormones. Right. Um, <clears throat> I also became very adept. I'm a social chameleon, so I became very adept at organizing and finding uh, sources about uh, uh, sourcing the products yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, that we wanted. So um, Anybody who had what I wanted, I was able to befriend them, figure out their sources, and go. And I was able to orchestrate better deals, uh, find ways to to get product to more people. Right. Well, um, so, it, so, it, so I mean, you you know, you you just kind of jumped. You were in college. I, I, I did jump. So <laughs> you did. were in college. So you, you did you? Are you still being a plumber? Or this is this yeah. is. It, it became. Hey, now people are seeing res your result, and they're yes. asking you about it. Yes. Or, or I did. I did I, I took a little leap there. You're right. Yes, yeah, so I was in college, I was researching everything, and then, um, so people noticing my improved stature would come to me and ask, uh, you know, how I did that. Yeah. So I started just teaching pe my friends for free and showing them here, this is what I do. Um, you know, at very first it was, I would just get them some of the stuff that I was getting. Right. Um, and, and people, it, this was an important part, it's a good thing you brought me back, because um, people would then show me so much admiration and respect for helping them do the same thing it did for me right right so so that drives a passion so now that when people when i start to become known the guy if you want if you want to look good you go to this guy right here and and that drove a lot of respect um i was actually valuable for one of the first times in my life like i actually had value to other people right that drives more passion so this passion just kept building up um um, so, so eventually I start kind of monetizing this. I realized that I'm doing this a lot. A lot of people are coming to me. So yeah, I should be so, paid for it. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I just, you know, obviously that's when I started finding supply chains, getting, you know, better orchestrating, better deals. And I, and I would, you know, start marking up the products obviously, but I was getting, you know, I started getting better at getting better deals and, uh, and it was just like a little side gig at first, like, uh, you know, after a little while, it started to become, I started to become one of the number one guys in the entire city. I live in a small city, but one of the number one guys in the entire city, everybody knows where to go when you want to look good right. and feel your best. And, uh, you know, and I would educate people. I'd show them exactly how to do it, exactly how to do this. So people weren't in the dark. You right. know, um, a lot of people, you know, go get some off some gym guy and they, they don't give them much information. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and so they don't know exactly what they're doing. And, you know, you, you know, it's can you know it can be a, a little dangerous, although uh, not necessarily. I don't. Know. Um, but I was specifically educating people on exactly what was going on in the chemistry of what was happening and, and what to look out for. And people could always come to me if there was an issue, and I would always solve it. So I developed this into just a little like part-time business. Um, as I said, I was the the guy to come to in my city, but it was a small city. I wasn't I wasn't still not making enough to to actually support myself on it. Um, and then there came a point when I um, got caught doing that, this, this small time city stuff. So I went to prison. And this is in, in the city? Yeah. This, 
What, uh, what happened? How'd you get caught? Like, uh, <laughs> it, somebody uh, brought a, a a CI, right? Brought a cop right to me, mm-hmm. and I and I sold him just because the CI needed to. He got caught himself, yeah, so of course. Yeah, trickle so, down. Yeah, so he had to. Yeah, so and that's what happened. So he knew that I had steroids, so he brought this cap right to me, and uh, I sold it to him. Right. And I did a little bid in 2008 uh, oh, for, for well, how much steroids. Time did you get? Uh, I just did about six months total. I did a I did a shock program in lieu of. Oh, that's right. That's right. We got my sen- Yeah, my so sentence you got like two years. My sentence was two two. Yeah, right. two years. Two years post release, but in lieu of that, I did. A shot camp. Right. So and I was in for a total of about six months. State prison. Okay. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't much. But, um, so I got out and, okay, this is important. So, wait, yeah. This is important. So, before I, okay, so before I left, I, I did skip another spot. So before I left, I, as I said, I, I had been able to orchestrate deals and, and, and find you know, sourcing. So as serendipitously, um, one of my friends from Cornell uh, was home for the summer and, you know, we were, we were talking about all the, um, you know, the steroids. It, we call it gear. So sometimes I may accidentally say gear and gear means just any anabolic steroid. It's like a broad term for anabolic steroids. Okay. And that's what all the juice heads call it, gear. Okay. So sometimes I might accidentally say that and yeah. forget that other people may not know. So we were talking about gear, and uh, so when my friend goes, hey, this guy from Cornell gave me, the, gave me this. I ordered from here. The stuff came. It was really cheap and, and really um, and good. So I thought, all right, well, I'll just email this and see what happens. So, and I did, and the stuff was incredibly cheap. Sure enough, it came, and it was incredibly potent. Um, and this was a source from China. Right. And this so, is you just went to a website. It's just like it's a normal website. This wasn't even a website. Oh. It was a, just an email. Just an email address. So you email some guy in China. You say, this is what I want. This is what I want. And you, you Western need him some money and it shows up. Okay. And so at the time, like this was, a, you know, a, yeah, there wasn't a website. At the time, I mean, we're talking about what well, this was probably like 2000, uh, I don't know, three or three to five or something. So this was early in the, this was early in the, the and a, you know, the, you know, the, the, yeah, the inception of the, the, of um, the internet, which was about nine, early '90s, didn't really take off until right. late, yeah. late '90s, is when it really started right. blowing up. And by so 2000, yeah. now it's yeah, that's right, deep in. But I, I do have a question, real quick. Yeah. So when I was like 19, well, really probably, yeah, probably from 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. During those years, I was, you know, I was, I would take steroids on and off. You know, I took. Diana Ball, I took, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, DECA, I've taken, you know, tests. Oh, yeah, you did so, tell me that. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, when I, we were, I said I did when I was younger. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I, and matter of fact, uh, my, one of my best friends was a guy named Trent Calta, and his father owned three, three or four gyms called Frank Calta's Health Connections. He mm-hmm. was, um, he was like Mr. Florida. Um, and uh, uh, anyway, so all three of his sons, we were all friends. I'm mm-hmm. still friends to this day. And remember I said I worked at a gym? Yeah. yeah. That was what well, Treon called it, which was another one of the brothers, um, uh-huh. is the guy that hired me. Mm-hmm. So, but what's funny is, so we used to, when you're saying sourced material, now mm-hmm. you're saying from China. But mm-hmm. I remember, you know, we ha- actually had guys that would actually drive to Miami and would go into a pharmacy and the pharmacist would give them a bag of like, you know, of Diana ball or yeah. whatever, you know, they were like the pills, yeah. you know, and they'd give them the vial. I mean, it was right in the pharmacy. Oh We'd God. come back and drive back. So when you say source materials, are you saying that all of this stuff is kind of through China? Or are you saying, you're saying, I mean, are you, some of it coming directly from the pharmacies or are these guys mixing it up and just kind of making it themselves or? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, that's a good question. Um, yeah. So, so this was it, like, uh, this was the start kind of, I, I guess, of, it wasn't even the start of this. Uh, yeah, there was a. This became really, really big, but it was people just making it themselves in China, and um, this, there was a shift from stuff coming from pharmacies or Mexican pharmacies. Okay. You were getting one from Miami. I don't, I don't know the situation there, but my guess is that it was something. I just remember my buddy went right under in the, the pharmacy. Table. Yeah. I was like, holy. Yeah, geez. something under the table there. But uh, so, I mean, and that would be a unique way to do it. But you know, at the probably at this time or in the late '90s, like people were getting it from Mexico. Yeah. They're just 
um, or even Puerto Rico, they would find ways to ship it in the United States. And, and I know that's some of the other dealers that I was dealing with at the time were getting it from like Puerto Rico. Or, but and this this was the beginning of China, of the rise of China from for uh, anabolic steroids. And now to this day, everything comes from China. Uh, it's, it's it was just it's so much cheaper. Right. They uh, they don't have laws against it, so they try to sell it to Americans, and everything just shifted to China. Um, so you were emailing the guy. Yeah. So your... yeah. So I, I email this guy. Sure enough, it comes, and it's 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 good stuff, and uh, and it's incredibly cheap. I mean, and we're talking when I talk about cheap, I'm talking about like like you know these are going to be some of the best prices in the entire country. Like it is unheard of cheap. All right. Well, so what's so what we're talking about like like five bucks a bottle on average like five ten bucks and you're selling it for 50 or yeah, is it um, thirty dollars and you're selling it for a hundred yes, or I, when, when I when I when I get into I'll go over the profit margins because at this time I don't I can't remember the exact cost but okay. I do remember when I actually started my bigger business yeah, yeah. I do remember I have okay. memory of all okay. the profit margins and everything okay, I can yeah, go over cool. that at this time I, I honestly can't remember the prices but it was so you're getting stuff But in. stuff was expensive at this time like, right. because it still wasn't easy to make. But this was the beginning of China, you know, becoming becoming the main source of, of all steroids that in, in, the United, in the world. Right. Um, and so it was, begin, it was starting to get cheaper. This is the very beginning of it, okay. starting to get cheaper. Before this, it was very expensive. Um, um, where was I? Oh, yeah. So yeah. – so, I had this source, right? So when I got caught, one of my clients, it was also a friend of mine, and he was probably buying the most from me. Um, I just, you know, I needed to do something. So, uh, you know, in kind of in my mind to set, possibly set something up from the future. I didn't know what was going to happen, but I just gave him this source and said, look, I'm going to give you up my source. Um, I want you to save this, do what you will with it. And when I get back out, if I call you, Whatever you've created, I just want to be a part of it. Right. right. Um, so I, so that's what I did. So I get out not too much later. I'm on a, I'm on parole for a couple of years, and I'm I'm just I'm trying to be good, <laughs> trying. Um, but you know now that I have a felony, uh, you know a felony. Well, this is my second felony. Um, now that I have a felony, it's, I can't get a job. It, um, I I put. Um, resumes and everywhere. I just I, I couldn't find a job. Uh, I can't support myself. Um, I I had I went back on steroids myself. That made me feel a lot better. Now and now I had nothing to do except go to the gym. So I'm actually I'm doing double sessions and right. I'm getting pretty big again at this point. Um, so again, though, my size makes people come to me, and I'm like I'm fighting it off for a while. I don't want to get back into what put me in prison. But, um, poverty will do some. Yeah, some yeah. things to you <laughs> so i you know I, I just started moving some again to uh to s at least give myself something to survive um and it, yeah, so that starts getting bigger and bigger again and eventually i get off i get off parole and um again like it's a small city so i'm not uh I, i'm not able to completely supplement my life with this but it helps it right. helps so one of my clients one day um tells me about this this online now we're talking about probably 2010 2011 well, what happened with your buddy that you gave the oh, yeah. okay yeah Sorry. that will come <laughs> but uh no that's a, it's good that you uh, you brought that up but yeah it's gonna come um right now actually uh one of my friends who I was one of my clients told me about this online forum that is a source forum. So essentially it's it's kind of like the concept of the dark net, but right. it's not it wasn't the dark net. It's just a it's just a, a forum, a yeah. body not even a bodybuilding forum, it's a steroid source forum, but it was hosted from a different country where steroids are illegal. So it, but they were had United illegal or illegal? Were they illegal, right? Okay. So so, um, but they had sources in the United States, right? So it has a list of all these sources in reviews and it had them numbered, right? So the top source, you know, with, you know, with the best reviews is at the top and, you know, it goes down and I'm looking at this and this is, this is crazy. Right? <laughs> this is, I mean, just right out in the open. Yeah. Um, but then, so I started doing research and I realized that with the source that I had, the Chinese source, cause I had it again and I was using it. Um, the, the same Chinese source. 
um, I could compete with all these prices. So I started thinking, like, I can do this. Like, I, I, could, I can compete with these guys. I can undercut everybody. These are guys from all over the country. I, I can cut, undercut the whole country here. And this is the, by the way, this is the biggest source forum in the world for, for anabolic steroids. It gets like a million unique hits a, a month. Okay. It, it was massive. It's the biggest one. So, so this was something. I, I'm like, holy shit, I can do this. So I ended up like, I'm, I'm starting to prepare for it. I buy, um, I buy like an extra, you know, some extra to just to prepare for this, an extra stock. I got my laptop and my you know, duffel bag full of steroids and I'm, I'm ready to, to post on here. So right about this time, um, that friend that I left it with, his name is Gene. It's okay, I'll just say his first name. He's actually not with us anymore. But uh, um, Gene comes, all of a sudden I get a call from Gene, right? And I thought it was kind of strange because it's, it's probably been a couple of years now. And, uh, and I was like, okay. So I answered the phone and he's like, hey, uh, what are you doing? I'm, I'm in town. I'm almost, I'm on my way to your, you know, driving by your house. Can I stop in? It was kind of weird, but I was like, oh yeah, it would be good to see him. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Stop in. So he comes in and he pulls up in a brand new, now this is a guy who never, you know, he, he you know, I don't even think he finished high school. He never never was able to put anything together and just kind of was sliding by in life. And he was kind of similar to me, like just selling some steroids and whatever else he could get his hands on every once in a while. And, that, and he was just kind of sliding by life with that. Um, but you had slipped him the kind of the golden ticket. <laughs> he pulls in with a brand new, fully decked out Hummer, right? We're talking about a ninety to $100,000 vehicle. Right. I'm just like, what the heck? He gets out, you know, and he, he's got this big smile on his face. He comes and he just gives me a big hug. I'm like, holy shit, what's going on? He grabs this bag out of the back of his house. He goes, let's go inside. Okay. So we go in. Oh, by the way, at this time, I, live with my, I lived in my grandmother's house because I couldn't afford anything else. So, but, um, so I just lived in my, my grandmother's house. I, you know, I couldn't afford any. I wouldn't have been able to afford rent anywhere anyway. So I was kind of lucky I had that opportunity. Um, so he comes in. He's got this bag. He opens his bag up, and it's full of steroids and money. And he's got, he's got just uh, um, wads of hundred dollar bills in there. It must have been thirty grand in there. And I had never seen all that that kind of money in one place. Like right. you know, at this time, I was um, I, like, "What? What the hell is going on?" He just starts throwing steroids at me. Here, here you go. Here you go. Like, what the hell is going on? He goes, "I took that source you gave me and turned it into this, into this." You know this giant organization. I'm like, what the what the hell is going on? So he starts telling me. He doesn't tell me exactly what he's doing, right? But he he's hinting and kind of laying out a model and a structure that he that he's using. To now he's selling um, he's selling a little bit of everything, right? Anything you want, but. Um, most of his revenue is coming from the steroids, from the source. So he teaches me a little bit more about the source. He teaches me that you can get your prices even lower because I did, and this is how you do it. And he goes, you, you talk to the guy. And, and so now I go back and I, I email my source. He taught me how to actually get lower prices. And I mentioned this guy's name and the source. Now, this is at this time, this is one of the biggest sources in the entire world because this, this guy sold, sold all over the world. Right. And, but he knows Gene's name, you know, just by his name. He instantly was like, oh, Gene is a great guy, you know. So then I know that Gene's for real. He's doing massive numbers. I mean, obviously, he's showing me that he's got houses and multiple, multiple cars that are worth a lot of money. It's crazy. He said he made $900,000 the last year. And so, so now, now I know that this can be, that this can work. I know that I... You know, there, there's something I can do with this that can generate that, you know, that kind of income. And, and he's just got a different air about him, right? He's, um, he's confident. He's, you know, he's very deliberate in his actions. And, and he's just like a different person. And you can see why he's successful almost. Right. Um, so I knew, I knew that something, that this could work. So, you know, Gene leaves and I, I start getting this idea. And I said, like, he tells me briefly about this model. So I... Now I'm even more driven to, to get this internet thing going, right? 
So the first thing I do is... Um, Does Eugene give you any money? No. Oh, he right. gave me some steroids, but he gave me a lot of information. Yeah. Okay. So it wasn't about... I didn't ask him for anything. I didn't... Yeah, I thought we had an agreement when you went to yeah, prison. And Here's you know the thing. To be, to build something, give me something. What to happened be honest to that? with you, I didn't push it. Had I pushed it, he may have done that. He, right. was, he was a pretty loyal guy. He was a, he was a good guy. And I didn't, but I didn't push it. Um, right. I actually, because I had these ambitions of my own. Yeah. Right? So why share something with him when, you know, kind of in my mind, like I can start it. Yeah, empire, yeah. Right? Yeah, I'm about, but, to, I'm about to cut this guy's leg off from underneath <clears> him. So why, why also have him give me 50 grand? Right. So... <laughs> You didn't like the way I put that. No, I, it's yeah. incredibly accurate. Okay. <laughs> that's that's what makes me laugh. Is you're gonna see that it's it's accurate. Right. Um. So, so I, but he he set the seed. He planted the seed. Right. So, the first thing I do is I go, and uh, so at the time there was nothing sophisticated about this. You just go. I made a list of products that I had available, and and you just post it on a on the forum, right? right, And you say, here's my stuff, you know, come buy it. So I did that. Um, I didn't know what to expect. So now I have to explain a little bit about the zeitgeist of the time, or the, the ethos regarding anabolic steroids. And as we, as we stated before, um, steroids were hard to get in the late 90s, early 2000s, very hard to get. So, and consequent, and they're very expensive. Consequently, there was a lot of fraud, right? There was a lot of people making fake stuff, and everybody, every single bodybuilder, was scared to death of getting fake gear. It was expensive. It wasted a lot of their time, you know, and they because you have to you do it for a while, a while and then realize that yeah, it's two, nothing, yeah, and, 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 and it costs a lot of money. Yeah, it's it's just a, <laughs> getting fake stuff is annoying, and everybody was terrified about it. So, <clears throat> the, at the time, the Here's another term I'm going to use. Um, UGL, underground lab, is where you know, people make it themselves. Right. It's called an underground lab. At the time, underground labs were not a thing. I take that back. They were just very, they were just starting to be, there was only a couple. Right. But there was, you know, just prior to this, there was only, you, if you didn't have a brand name product, if you didn't have something that everybody knew, they would laugh you out of the building and actually get angry at you for suggesting, even if somebody did, if you offered brand name products and people didn't know you, if you didn't have a brand or a trust, people would get angry. These forums, bodybuilders are, are, are very angry, distrustful, um, you know, degrading people. And, and it, it's met with hostility and animus. And so, you know, me, me just coming in uh, and just putting this list up w without having a name, uh, you know, m made people angry. Mm -hmm. So, so like, I, you know, I got hit with a bunch of people laughing, a bunch of people like, you're crazy, like, you know, uh, a, lot of, a lot of hostility, like I said, and animus. And, uh, and then the mods took the post down. So and it was only up for about an hour, and I was like, "What the heck just happened?" Like, I, like so, you know. And after doing some some more research, <clears throat> I found out that well, one of the posts, one of the mods actually emailed or private messaged me after that. Right, said, the moderators, yeah, one right. of the moderators, uh, and they said, uh, "This isn't how we do it anymore." So, so they, this is how it used to work. You just post, and and people can buy if they want. But because there was so much fraud, you know there had recently been some fraud, they, they decided to instill just one rule is you have to have a website. And that would show them that maybe you, if you go through the trouble of creating a website, um, that you're serious enough to be a source, right? right. On, this, on the biggest steroid source in the world, right? So to me, I didn't know anything about, about websites. I had no idea. It was 2011 at this point. It wasn't a big thing, but especially I had no idea. So to me, it was almost over. Like right there, I was like, I, I don't, I can't do this. That's it. Right. It's done. Um, but then, so then I, I started thinking about it and I was like, boy, I got this one friend who's one of my clients and he knows a lot about this stuff. So that was my first employee. I paid him in steroids and I said, hey, can you build me a website? He was like, yeah, sure, I can do that. So, um, I mean, it's, it's more complicated than just building a simple website because you, you can't just, you know, go on GoDaddy or Wix or, or, uh, WordPress and just build a website and because uh, it has to be uh, anonymous right. right and it has to be hosted from outside this country right 
So it, it was, it's more complicated than that. And it, it took this guy, he had to go do some research and figure out how to host a website outside the United States so that the, if the United States, you know, any law enforcement was to catch on, they wouldn't have any jurisdiction to go. Um, to get a subpoena, to, it, to right, get records, to get the, the information, this, yeah, this of the hosted the emails, States. you have all the information, right? They wouldn't have any jurisdiction to go right. to it. So that's the idea, right? Um, so in the meantime, while he's working on that, I got three emails from the post that I put up for one hour. Well, everybody else laughed at me. A couple guys saw opportunity, and they just and, and so. <clears throat> They emailed me, and I, I'm looking at these emails, and so the, and I noticed they they told me what their handles were on this on this forum, right? And the way this forum works is that they rate you, you get points for for being helpful, for you know posting a lot, for giving helpful information. You get these points, and these points represent your respect in the community, mm -hmm. right? So these guys had a lot of points, which means a lot of people respected them in this in, in this huge forum, and a lot of people would listen to them. Right. So these guys, uh, they they tell me that they saw the post. They're very interested because because I had. Sorry, I had. Um, um, yeah, they're very interested because uh, uh, I had name brand products at the time. Right. So. So to tell you a little bit about this, uh, one of the five or six accepted brands in the world was British Dragon. And that's that's what my the products I had. The ironic thing is that British Dragon actually went down, the real British Dragon company went down a few years prior to this. And everybody knew that. But the source that I was using started just slapping British Dragon labels on their products and started selling them and everybody knew it, but the products were still quality. Right. right. So there's kind of maybe assuming this is just old. This is just yeah. So now you don't know. Yeah, well, you don't know which one you're getting, but they're both good. So it nobody cared. Yeah, it was irrelevant. it was a rare case where where somebody came in with and relabeled the products, and everybody was okay with it. Like right. the entire underground black market community right. was it okay. Had a, with it. it had a great name, right? Because it was still good, right? So yeah. the British Dragon name it just carried on, and it was like, okay, British Dragon is still good. Doesn't matter which one it is, if yeah. it's the real one or the new or the new relabeled one. And I had, and this was my guy. So, so he was, um, so now I had this British Dragon stuff that everybody's okay with. So the fact that I had British Dragon and there wasn't a ton of people selling it in the United States at that time, at that time, um, people were intrigued. You have a, well, you have one of the five name brands that everybody's okay with. So, so these guys say, you know, but I can't, I can't just b buy this from you because there's too much fraud going on. I don't know who you are or what's going on. So why don't you send me this stuff? If I get it and it's real, I'll post about it. You know, and I'll send, in fact, I'll send you a bunch of guys. I got a lot of people on here that yeah. follow, follow me around. Yeah. And that's definitely a way to get back on the web, back on the, um, yeah. as a, as a vendor back on the site by yes. having, by having established people basically vouch for you yes. saying, Hey bro, I bought yeah. this stuff. It's good. And mm -hmm. then the moderator's like, okay, but this is so-and-so yeah. he says it's good. It's good. Yeah. That, that's it helps. It's it the very least. It certainly does. Yeah. It certainly does. Um, at the time, like. At the time, like I was reticent, like like a lot of people was, like I was reticent to send somebody something for free. In my mind, like you know, it's I can't just give somebody you know some of this. And in retrospect, I shouldn't have been so reticent because this is a good way to get your product out, and you shouldn't you know this, this is business lesson number one that um, that if you have a good quality product, you need to get it out there, and that's yeah. more important than worrying about profit margins. And and that's where a lot of people make mistakes, and I almost made that mistake, but but I didn't. I ended up sending these, I ended up saying, well, guys, you know, I don't want to just give away, you know, some of these products, but how about this? I'll send it to you if, once you realize it's good, you get it and it's good, can you pay me later? And they all were like, yeah, sure, we can do that. Okay. So I sent these guys the, the orders that they want. And um, so, so at this, this time, I also, I, I finally got a job and I, I was working at the emergency room. Um, I, I was only making like nine dollars an hour. I made like I made two hundred and seventy dollars a week, and I still couldn't support myself on that. So I, I had to do, you know I had to keep doing something else. So I remember I was actually um, I would actually work at the emergency room, and I would check my emails. I would I mean I would do my illegal business work at the emergency room, which in retrospect was really stupid because the IT can see everything that you're doing on their computers. 
Um, but I was checking my emails, and and all of a sudden, and I, I mean, there's I wasn't getting any emails from anybody except for those three ambassadors. There's three of them. I call them the ambassadors. And all of a sudden, I had, I had like you know five or six emails from people I didn't know, and that didn't make any sense to me. So I answered them, and sure enough, these guys, hey, one of the the main one that that sent me the most people, his name, was, his handle was Sicko, C Y C O, Sicko, right? And he said, Sicko sent me. He said, you're good, so I'll take this, this, and this. And it just, it just blew my mind. Like, I, had, I ended up taking three orders right there. Tell me how to pay. And I had never even thought of this. I'm like, how do I get people to pay? I, did for, I actually hadn't thought that far ahead. I'm like, how do I? Oh, shit. Everybody pays Western Union. I, gotta, I, just have, I didn't know what to do, so I was like, okay, just Western Union me some money, like in my name, which, you know, in retrospect, is pretty stupid, <laughs> but... That's how it started. So I just gave him my information. Western Union me this. I, I still didn't believe it was happening. Like, this is actually, this is actually going to happen. Right. So I think these guys, these three guys right there, just from this one guy. Oh, yeah. So then I went back on the, the forum, and I'm like, what is going on? Like, and I look, and sure enough, this sicko guy had posted pictures of the stuff that he got, said, this was like a couple weeks later, said he had started trying it, and the stuff is fantastic. And uh and you know a lot of people respected him, and he, as he, you know, as he said his word, he would send me people. Um. So this order, I think it only it came to like eleven hundred, uh, eleven hundred fifty dollars, I remember. And um, I I went and I cashed the money out, and and I actually had that much money, and I think from that I made like five hundred fifty was pure profit of mine, and I had never made that much in one day. And I just remember this warm feeling in my chest, like just warm, just, just dopamine rushed through me. And it just felt good. And I'm like, and, and it just, you know, I'm hooked. Like, this is, <laughs> this is fantastic. Um, so, you know, I went, so I went back to the sicko guy and I said, hey, you sent me some guys. Thank you so much. He goes, oh, that's nothing. I'm going to, I got about 30 more that are going to be coming your way. So it was him and, the, and one of the other ambassadors you know, sent me like 30 or 40 guys. This is, I don't, I'm not even a source on this, on this, yeah, th this yeah. should, in retrospect, this should have been an omen as to what was to come yeah. because I'm not even a, a source on this thing. How far are you undercutting everybody else's price? I wasn't undercutting everybody. So this is, it's a great question. I wasn't undercutting everybody's price that, that much, only a little bit. And I kind of did that intentionally because, you know. Yeah, you don't want to give it away. I don't, right. What I was doing differently so this is, so um, part of the business lessons, these things just sort of made sense to me. But I did, in retrospect, after I look back on it, I made a lot of very, very advanced and very good business moves. Um, when I went to prison later, I was able to read voraciously. And I, I read, everything I read was, you know, was to help me. So I read a lot of, a lot of uh, biographies on entrepreneurs. I read a lot of entrepreneurial books. I read NBA um, textbooks. And I realized that, that I, had, I had actually been implementing some of these advanced business techniques, and I didn't even know. It just made sense to me at the time. And these business, you know, some of these things that I did are what are a large part of what created what was to come. Um, so... To answer your question about what, what kind of started setting me apart, and this was the beginning of it, what kind of started setting me apart was um, black market steroid dealers are not known to be masters of business administration. They, uh, you know, they're just these, right. these freaking guys who are just trying to make a profit, um, and they, they don't know what they're doing. So, so the, their shipping times, they would send everything snail mail. So everybody, even domestic, was getting things at this time in in uh, two weeks it right. was taking about two weeks they were making people pay for shipping right uh and th this another major thing that they did wrong is um when when you have something that somebody wants right so these people would create a these sources would create a big following of people you have something somebody wants people become almost sycophantish about following you and, and being servile to Oh, you give me you give me this thing that I need. So you're you know you're great, you're awesome, and they they kiss their ass, and these people become um, megalomaniacal, right? They right. become megalomaniacs, right? And <clears throat> so 
and this, uh, this manifests in, they would start getting rude to their customers. If you, if you dare um, question them about something that possibly went wrong, then, then these guys have these big egos and they would, just, they would start ripping apart their own clients. Now that made sense to me, but it would turn people away. Yeah. Um, so, and I, so I made a mental note and I saw this happening. I made a mental note that I'm never gonna do that and I'm gonna be very cordial and friendly to everybody and take care of and take ownership of any problems that occur and right. fix it. So between having quality products, having low price, implementing some relatively simple good business practices, such as I did free shipping. Right. I did priority shipping, which got it, the products to people in two to, five, two to three days. This was just revolutionary for the market. And by the way, after I started doing this, that became industry standard. And I started this with anabolic steroid dealers. But now, you know, shortly after I started doing it, because everybody started flooding to me, um, the entire industry changed to these simple. And again, it's not advanced. Those aren't advanced business. That was simple. Um, so now everybody who's getting these new orders is, uh, um, is posting. How uh, going to, and, and, uh, yeah, this stuff is good. It came in two to three days, uh, and that was a big one. When people can get their stuff quick, they were just – so it just – people started flooding me. Mind you, I'm still not a source, an official source. I'm not even on this, on this website. Right. And, and I'm starting to, to get a, a big following and a big business because of all these – you know, all of this. So then comes the day. I remember I open, I, I get up one morning, I open my, uh, I, so we got the website completed. Um, you know, my friend got it completed, we opened it up, I went to the, to the mods, I said, here you go, here's my website, can I be a source now? And like, it, mad, days went by, and I was like, uh, maybe they're just not going to do it, like, right. I, I don't know, it was like, uh, like uh, I was still working on it, but it in one respect, I was still getting a lot of customers just from this. Yeah, so this it wasn't thing. the end all be all. You're right. It was just kind of like you know, I, I don't It'd know what's nice. happening. Yeah. It'd be nice if I was on the yeah. forum. On, on the forum, forum. Yeah. Yeah. I wake up one morning and and I have m almost double, maybe even triple the amount of emails that I usually have. And I have a ton of. And then I go to my website. What the heck is going on? I, I go to the go to this the forum. I sign into my account. And things just look different. And I have a ton of PMs to uh, private messages. And it, that was kind of unusual. What, what is going on? Like, something looks weird. Something looks different. And I start to slowly kind of figure it out. And all these people, like, I have people ordering on the PMs. Like, there's a ton of orders. Uh, and then I, I start to look, and I realize that I have a source tag now next to my name. So that means, like, I've been labeled as an official source, and I'm up on the list, and I'm, right. and now there's, you know, there's, this is real. Uh, right there, my orders doubled. So, um, so, so then you know it was the same thing. Oh, holy cow! So I just you know start doing taking care of taking care of business, getting everything done, and and it does the same thing. Like people just keep posting, and and pretty soon that th pretty soon this business just absolutely just blew apart. It just blew up. I was so there was one. There's a point when I got so overwhelmed that I almost quit. I woke up another morning, I woke up, I had, so I had, a, I did a, a, an eight hour shift at the ER. Mm -hmm. I, I did like the three to 11 shift. I get off at um, 11 o'clock, I come home, I answer, hunt, you know, 200 emails. I pack all the orders. I have to go collect all the money in the morning. I have to do all this stuff by myself and then I have to go, and collecting the money from Western Union was a pain in the ass too. And I have to go. This is still money coming in your name. Maybe by this point, I think I finally. What I would do is. So this is what I started doing. I started just paying people for their IDs. Anybody yeah, who looked any remotely like me, I, was say. I would give somebody a hundred bucks for yeah. their ID. And so now I'm collecting it in other people's names, but it's still me collecting it. Right? Um. Yeah, at least it gives you a little wiggle. Around. Yeah, but for I did that for a little bit. I I changed that pretty quick though. Um. So. Oh yeah, so I wake up one morning after you know all this, and I have so I have to go do all this stuff. I so I wake up in the morning. I still got to go collect the the Western Unions. I got to take the packages to the post office, and I and then I have to go to work again. I get up, I open my email, and holy shit, if there isn't two hundred more emails 
and I got a ton of people just counting on me and waiting, waiting, you know, for me to order this. People are, you know, they're getting antsy. They want, <laughs> they want the stuff. There's payments in there. Um, I, I just started to get overwhelmed. Like I can't. I, how am I? I can't handle all this. You how am I going to do this? Get rid of the ER job. That, <laughs> that, that twenty, yeah. that that forty hour week job. Yeah, That's yeah. the problem. I was making the, the, the the, the orders 70, aren't the problem. I was making seventy bucks a day, and yeah, and I was no, making. No. That's your problem. I was making, started making that in five minutes. So, um, yeah. So I'm overwhelmed, and I'm not a man who's prone to panic attacks. But if I ever had one in my life, it was right here. I remember sitting down um, after I picked up all this money that was in these new orders. I was going to have a hundred thousand dollars cash at my house, and I'd never dreamed in my entire life that I would be holding that kind of money. Right. And I mean, this is, like I said, I went from $270 a week, which I couldn't support myself on, to now it, within a relatively very quickly, I'm pulling in about $21,000 a week. And, and I just, I got absolutely overwhelmed and I had a panic attack. I, I buried my head in my hands. I sat down. I'm like, you know, I, I can't do this. I'm going to get caught. This got way too big. Yeah, $100,000 yeah. at my house. I, this is all I, within, I have all these orders. I got to go to work. This is within a month or so, right? Um, this was probably, yeah, uh, this is probably a couple months, a, a couple months later, maybe three or four. Yeah, and by six months where I was pulling in about 21000 a month, and it just kept growing from there. Um, so, uh, so I'm sitting there like, I can't do this. I, I'm going to get caught. This right. got out of control. I can't handle this anymore. I'm done. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pay everybody, um, or I'm gonna fill all the orders of people who have paid, but I'm gonna tell everybody that I can't, I'm, I'm done, I can't do this anymore. So I'm not gonna let anybody else pay, and then, you know, and then I'm just, I'm done. So I, I had a plan, right? So I started to feel a little better. And then what, what hit me is, so I used to get emails every single day mm -hmm. of people thanking me for what I did, for what I do for them, right? I make them a better, a better wife to their, uh, better husband to their to their wives. Right. A better father to their children. They have energy to go out, and you know, play with their kids to actually do something. To actually, they have energy and confidence to go do better at their jobs, make more money to support their family, and, and people would thank me for that and say that I made this process so easy and cheap for them that, um, that you know, I was almost a savior to them, and I got this every single day. Right. And that drives a passion, right? I'm, it's a, this isn't about me anymore. This is bigger than me. All these, you know, by, by this time I had hundreds, maybe even a thousand clients. Um, this isn't about me anymore. This is about something bigger than, than myself. So, and I started thinking about letting all these people down. And so, you know, at this point, a lot of, like, a lot of people just kind of simply in, in a facile manner they brush drug dealers off as you're greedy. Oh, you're greedy. You just wanted you just wanted money and you wanted to go. And that's not what this is about. And you know, I, I was in prison around. Uh, There's a lot of drug dealers around, yeah. and I knew these guys, and and it, and it, they're not bad guys. And it wasn't all about greed. A lot of it was about finally that they can do something to create value for themselves. Right. Like finally, finally they have something. Because no matter what you have if you have cocaine or whatever people you have what people want and they respect and admire you for right. being able to provide them with something that they want yeah right and that that drives a value i'm creating value for all these people even in in your our evolutionary biology can't tell the difference about from you know negative help right with, from drugs or positive help right so um so, so what, what actually drives a lot of this, not all of it, I mean, some of it is money because, you know, money allows you to do a lot of things, but um, what drives a lot of this is finally finding something that where people respect and admire you, right? right? And, and you're creating value for a lot of people. So that's what drove it. It wasn't, it wasn't about greed. I didn't, the first thing I thought of wasn't about losing the money. It was about the people. So, so finally I said, I just picked my head up, you know, now I had a, I had a plan and I said, fuck this, I can do this. So I was overwhelmed and, and the, the first thing I had to do was, uh, was expand. I had to scale. So I just started hiring people. And now I had from Gene, I had some ideas about, um, about how to structure this model. 
right, about how to delegate all this responsibility and, uh, and leave myself open um, so I could do things more for business development and do what I was really good at, which is dealing with the customers. So I just started, I hired, hired all the positions out. I, I hired a shipper. I hired a, um, later I would hire a chemist, but that's, that's not quite yet in the story. Or I would hire multiple chem chemists, multiple shippers. Um, and I hired, um, uh, I had like a little army of people going around collecting money. So I had people going to pick up Western unions and then eventually, um, but so anyways, I had all these jobs compartmentalized, right? So the idea was that I was going to set up this, this business model in a way that each person did their job and they didn't know anybody else in the operation. So this right. would, this would make it so if something happened, if yeah, something got busted, yeah, yeah. then yeah, that it would be compartmentalized and nobody would be able to tell on each other because they don't know anything. Right. So, and that was the idea. So I started doing that. I started compartmentalizing. These people didn't know each other. They're all separate. And then eventually I moved it out of, this, out of states. Like people didn't, who worked for me weren't in the same states. So I had employees all throughout the country and none of them knew each other. Right, okay. Um, that, that was kind of a little later, but, yeah. but that was the idea. And I started implementing that here and then I spread it out later. And, um, so, yeah, so now everybody's got their jobs. It, it allows me to work on business development and um, and the, the customers. I have an army of people are collecting you money. Still staying? Are you still in like your grandmother's basement? Yeah. Or are you serious? Yeah, in her house. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I was still. Li yeah, I was still living there. I mean, you're making twenty something thousand dollars a month. Yeah. Bar. Yeah. But it Get was a place. <laughs> that's what a lot of that's what so that's what a lot of people said, and I did, but I I rented them out. So so all I could see is that, like there was a time when I started buying real estate property. Right but I would fix it up and, and rent it out because I, all I could see was revenue from that. And, and I was okay in that house. I mean, it was, I was just there by myself and it was, uh, uh, it was adequate for me. So, right. and, you know, I was just all about revenue, revenue generation. Um, so, I can't remember where we are. Yeah, yeah you were compartmentalizing everything. Yeah. You were expanding. You'd hired a bunch of uh, yeah. a bunch of shippers. You'd hired um, you hadn't quite hired the chemists yet, but you were yeah. you were hiring people, and you were kind of just scaling the whole thing. Yeah, up. yeah. Um, and I'm 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 wondering, like these people realize that they're shipping. They realize that what they're shipping isn't mm -hmm. legal. It's not like you had them fooled. Like, hey, you work for a pharmaceutical <coughs> company. Yeah. So the excuse me. <coughs> Try to inhale that. Yes. So, yeah, everybody knew exactly what they're doing. So, the, um, interestingly enough, so if you look up my case, uh, the the prosecution put out the narrative that uh, that I hired unknowing people and they didn't know exactly what they're doing and that I paid them poorly. Yeah. And this couldn't be. F yeah. This could not be farther from the truth. Yeah. Um, what happens is the so everybody get you know I, eventually when a crime's done everybody gets indicted they bring everybody in they interrogate them and, and nobody yeah and nobody's gonna be like oh yeah worked for ryan root he was a fantastic gentleman i yeah. recommend everybody work for him he paid me well and i uh yeah. i knew yeah. precisely what i was doing That's, i didn't realize i thought i i thought it was legal he said yeah, he was a yeah. pharmaceutical rep yeah. oh, he didn't pay I, me anything anyways i didn't <laughs> That's that's precisely what happened. So so this narrative just and the so the media doesn't call me. They just take whatever the prosecutor of says course. and put it in the yeah. and put it in the paper. Yeah, and nothing could be farther from yeah. the truth. It's I've, funny you, you'll see the press releases and <laughs> literally the press releases are almost written verbatim uh, uh, in all the newspapers. Precisely. Like it's like the the U.S. attorney just yeah. wrote the press release yes. for the Associated Press, the New York Times. The Chicago Tribune, yeah. the Tampa Tribune, mm -hmm. like it's Absolutely like it's correct. almost identical. Absolutely correct. Yeah, yeah, and it, it, so it, it's it's one of the problems and one of the things that's needed in prison reform. Like, the, so the media is called the fourth estate, right? They, they they guide public opinion, and if they're just puppets. just passing on, yeah, if they're just puppets for the prosecution, right. which is trying everything that they can do to. Um, Demonize you. Or you demonize you and rationalize their own existence, right? Yeah. By saying, we put this dangerous guy off, off the street. And yeah. in reality. Yeah, yeah. How yeah. dangerous are you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, that's a whole, a whole different discussion. All right. So this is getting bigger. Yeah. You're starting to make more money. Yeah. You're on the forum. You're shipping product. Yeah. 
I mean, what's what's the next what's the next um, thing that happens? Yeah. Okay. So this is when some of the advanced business concepts started started coming in. So there was a later I read um, some books which I highly recommend to anybody interested in entrepreneurship by uh, Nassim Taleb. Um, he wrote Black Swan, Anti Fragile, and Skin in the Game, and one more, and I can't remember what it is. But these books were absolutely fantastic about. Um, so what I what I realized at the time, it just this just made sense to me. What I real and later when I was able to read these and read voraciously, I realized the whole that, holy cow, I was implementing these these concepts and I didn't even realize it. Um, but at, so at the time, I have this one Chinese source. And there was times when he got a little flaky, meaning he would like just disappear for yeah, a while. Yeah, yeah. What happens if he just disappears That's one exactly. day? I had, I'm, I'm with, you know, what later is termed fragile. I'm fragile. I have, or I have all my eggs in one basket. Yeah. If something happens to this guy, I'm. This was a black swan. He disappears. My whole business is gone. Yeah. What and happens, I started to realize that. What happens if YouTube decides to just stop paying me, Colby? <laughs> <laughs> What's gonna happen? We got we got one we got one resource. Yeah. We got one source. We yeah. needed some other sources. Yeah. So, so this is what Nassim Taleb. I've been Taleb. saying that. I've been saying <laughs> yeah. that. Nassim Taleb would say that you have to have optionality. You have to build contingencies. Yeah. You have to um, you have to build a robust yeah. system with mm-hmm. multiple multiple con- streams of revenue. Unfortunately, my contingency is fraud. Yeah. <laughs> and I keep me. I'm saying, well, yeah, there's always fraud, and I always get yelled at. Always go. So, yeah. <laughs> something to fall back on yeah exactly <laughs> um yeah so yeah so i'm fragile right right and so his book anti-fragile was about was about becoming the opposite of fragile right and that means that you not only do you build a robust system to have all these contingencies and redundancies for in case something goes wrong is that you build something that gets better when it's stressed um, and this is what I did. It, again, I don't want to say that I, I had this concept clearly in mind, but this is what ended up happening. So every, so I started making these moves, and everything I did was anti-fragile. Not only did, not only did it um, give me optionality and build, build a robust system, but, but my business grew when things that sh- could have been detrimental, it just made it better. And I'll give you an example. So this guy's getting flaky, right? So I'm like, okay, I got I to gotta build something more robust. I have to figure out another a contingency. So I started looking at other brands, brand names, right, of, of these other sources. And the price was too high. I would have had to raise my prices. And one of the things, one of my things that, that kept people coming to me was the low cost. So I, I couldn't do that. I couldn't raise my costs. You know, that would, that would dis, disappoint all my customers. <clears throat> so... I had a guy, now I'm a biochemist, but I had never made steroids myself. Mm-hmm. All, all the local dealers, we all knew each other, we're all friends. One of the local dealers, now also mind you that at this time I'm getting so big, I realized that I cannot tell anybody what I'm doing because what's gonna get me caught word of mouth. was word of mouth from a local cop who just wants to be a cowboy and come in and do something to, to find me out, right? So I know that that's what's going to get me caught. This anonymous stuff I'm sending across the country, that's all anonymous. Like these, nobody knows my name. Nobody knows anything. Yeah, you're it. dropping it in a, in a, yeah, in a it's drop box. Yeah, it's, it's showing up at the door, right? And we're using different post offices. You know, it, that's not the most dangerous part. The dangerous part was some people going and talking and the local cops, you know, being a cowboy. Concern, your concern is that somebody's going to get busted. Somebody's going to turn and, and wear a wire. Or somebody's going to... Even though your concern but, is that the, it's going to get around, and you're going to get busted by some not, local cop or something. Yeah, not even that somebody's going to get busted or wear a wire. Not, not even that. Just the the talking, um, right? Because we're bringing in, you know, especially for a small city, like we're bringing in so much money that it, it would draw a lot of attention. So, um, and I'm, we're you know the the local cops are out on the street. They you know the word would get back to them. Somebody would try to be a cowboy. So it was it was imperative that. Um, that everybody would keep quiet and you don't tell anybody. And we did a pretty good job of that. So, so I, I said that to, to say that um, all the local steroid dealers, we all knew each other, we were friends. Right. right? So I had known, um, 
about this one guy who, and I had been able to undercut everybody, so so I, I like monopolized the steroid market almost. But there was there was this one guy who was able to he learn how to he learned how to make his own products, and he'd been doing it for a while, so he made his own stuff and. You know, at the time, like I said, the zeitgeist was you don't trust anything like that. These didn't even have labels. Yeah, uh, yeah. So it was like iffy. But but everybody who did it was said it was really good and it was cheap. It was like actually cheaper than I could offer it. Right. And that's and and I had known that and it started to bother me. Like, so he's got to go. We got <laughs> no. Well, so it's it's He's one of two go. things. It's one of two things. I mean, obviously, I'm not not violent. I've never done anything like that. No, you, I hire, do that, you but... hire that stuff out. That's why I know a Mexican guy. I know a guy. But but you you're kind of under the right track though. There's something's got to be done, right? Um, and you could you could either go that route or you could just utilize what he's doing and partner with that oh, yeah, with yeah, that ability that. to to yeah. <laughs> to. to Make his assets yours, right? And that's that's the better business move. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I mean, if you want to go that <laughs> way, you could. Um, so it had bothered me that that he, this guy had better prices, and and you know, I I didn't understand anything about making it yourself. Uh, some research revealed that it was significantly cheaper than even my prices to to make it yourself. And so there's no way I could undercut him because right. he was making it for this ridiculously cheap price. And as I said, though, it wasn't a name brand. So I, this at the time, this couldn't have been anything big because he didn't even have labels. It was just this stuff in a vial and nobody would trust that. And that was my only saving grace. But, but the people who had said this stuff was fantastic and it worked well. And there's a lot of people. Um, so start making so, the labels. So, well, start putting the labels on So here on we myself. go. So, I, so I said, black uh, cat or black whatever that was, <laughs> dragon or whatever. Like, um, so we'll get Boziak to make some make some labels, mm -hmm. and he'll counterfeit some labels mm -hmm. and stick them on there. And so, Pfizer. I, like, yeah. <laughs> let's yeah. go get a Pfizer. Yeah. Pfizer. Let's. I can do yeah. this. Look. Yeah, rebranding has been done before. So. So I, I decided I, I come up with this, with this plan, that you know I, I set up one night. Um, I know. I think like, uh, um, coincidentally, we had we had actually hung out with him like the week before. So I, I put all this plan into place, and I actually I, I get some props. Um, I collected. I grabbed all my money I collected that week. So I had like I don't know twenty or thirty grand. Um, in my, in my, I brought it with me and all wrapped up in the Western Union, uh, union. And this was a prop to show them how much money we're making. Right. So I, and I have this plan about how I'm going to go about, about making this offer to him. Right. So I meet him at the bar. I say, Hey, I got something to talk to you about. And right away he's like, okay, let's go. Jeez. Like, so we, I, I got to do this right now. So I, you know, I'm, I'm nervous for some reason. So I, cause if he says no, I don't know what the hell it's, I'm going to do. Like, this is it. Um, this is the only option that I have. Right. Uh, I, so like, I'm kind of nervous. I'm kind of nervous. You have one source. Yeah. And if anything happens to that yeah. source, and he you get, go he under. He was getting flaky, too. He would right. take a month off. And, uh, and I was, you know, sometimes I would run low on product, and it made me, like, um, order a lot more product. Um, uh, but, but, you know, I don't know. I don't know. He, he's getting flaky. So. So this is it. Like, I can't think of anything else to do. So. And I got to do this right. I got to I got to land this sale, right? So um, I get nervous. I take a couple shots. And go, All right, let's go out to my car. And that's where I had my prop anyway. So <clears throat> I get out there. And, uh, so I told you about we didn't say anything to anybody because because this guy had no idea what we we're doing. He had no idea what I'd run into. He had no idea, which is surprising because he's he's in that market. He was a he was a dealer himself, and uh, you know and. You would think, you know, he would be one of the guys who would find out about what was going on, but he didn't because we we kept we all kept our mouths shut. So I pull him into the car, and I still remember, like when I started telling him this, I kind of had it planned out. His mouth just dropped open, and he was so shocked at the level. And I show him, look, I got thirty thousand dollars, and he he'd never seen that kind of money either, at, you know. And and his mouth was just open. He didn't say a word. Just you know, you could tell he was just out of shock. And I start telling him about, so listen, I've already put together what we can do. I, you know, I would, uh, he would make these vials. I would pay him $10 per vial, but I would provide all the materials, all of everything. I pay for everything. 
Um, he could make uh, 300 vials a day, you know, so he could make $3,000 a day if he wanted to. Right. Um, and, you know, and I said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to need these. I could probably, I could sell this at this rate. I'm going to need a lot of them. You have a chance right off the bat just to start making thousands of dollars uh, a week, if not, if not a day. Right. Um, and, and he just sat there with his mouth open, didn't say anything. And, and I was like, okay, so do you want to, you want to partner? Let's do this. Let's, let's build something. Let's build something that, uh, that everybody will recognize. Let's become a household brand. I think that's exactly right. how I told it. And he's, he was just like, okay, let's do it. And that's, that's all he said. So I, I, um, he, so at the time he understood the powder sources, he had good powder sources. So I just gave him like 15 grand or something and told him to get started. And, uh, and he, he did, he made it happen. All of a sudden one day he delivers uh, these vials um, and, th- and we made labels. So we made labels this time and, uh, and I called it Matrix. We were Matrix Labs. So to this day, if you still look up Matrix Lab steroids, my, my stuff and all my, the great comments will come up. Um, or the great reviews for it will come up. Um, but, and I made it a little stronger so that it would be, you know, so it would be potent. So the quality would be good. Um, and, and I'll get into more. We did more to make sure that the quality, that the quality was, you know, exceptional. Um, so, to wrap this around, oh, it, so now profit margins, right? So, oh yeah, so to wrap this around <clears throat> to anti-fragile again, right? Um, so I built this to build something robust, right? But now. As I said, most people would only get name brand products. So I had British Dragon stuff, and I so all of a sudden I, I, I offered this matrix that was my brand right. next to it. And I didn't expect, I expect the, the transition to that to be slower. Even though this stuff was stronger, it, was, it, was more, it had more milligrams per milliliter, it was stronger. Um, and I knew it was better. Um, and it was cheaper. It was a little cheaper. And I knew that, but I still thought because of the, the branding. Yeah, the loyalty. That, to, well, the, I, to the one brand. Or, or people know the British Dragon yeah. brand, right? And they're not going to s- switch. I thought it would be, it would take a while for people to start getting the Matrix stuff. Little did I know, it was, I was the brand. Like, right. I had instilled trust in these thousands and thousands of clients. And everybody came to buy from me. And they would, you know, as I said, uh, black market juice heads can be, you know, the most vehement uh, uh, um, uh, mercurial bunch who, you know, who gets angry at ev- uh, everything and very distrustful. But once you gain their trust, they can also be some of the most loyal people. So when, um, so when I offered this brand, it, I was the brand. So they, they would get anything that I offered. And when it was stronger and cheaper, right. everybody just started buying this stuff. And... It almost immediately, and nobody was buying this British Dragon stuff anymore. So, <clears throat> so, and, and I'll be damned if I mean I'm talking a month later, this Chinese source just disappeared, just gone. But wrapping this back around to anti fragile, I built something so my profit margin off of I used to buy these 25 milliliter vials from uh, from this Chinese source for fifty dollars which was an unheard of low price. Right. Um, I sold them for 125. My profit margin was 250%. This matrix stuff I was making, including paying the chemist and the shipping. I, this is everything. That, that one didn't include paying for shipping. Right. Um, including paying the chemist and shipping cost, a, um, cost me $20 for um a 20 milliliter vial and I sold it for a hundred. So my profit margin was 400%. So now by creating this, trying to create this, just this robust. So I had something to back off, off on when this guy disappeared, the stress on the business came and this, the, the Chinese source disappeared. Everybody went to the matrix brand anyways. And now my profit margins were higher. The, the cost of the product was less. I could, so it means I could buy more. I could, I could actually supply myself with more. And, and the business just took off. And the quality was so good because we were making it potent that now people were posting, this Matrix is fire. This Matrix brand is something else. Now all over the forums, not just the one I'm on, all the bodybuilding forums, the most popular bodybuilding forums across the entire country, you know, that, um, 
are, are all talking about this new Matrix stuff that is absolute fire. And it just drove so much traffic. Right. Like, like we, I mean, we were already doing 21 grand a month, and now we, we almost doubled in, in a month or two again, and then it doubled again just because of the word got out. So now, <clears throat> so the business got stronger. So that's what anti-fragile is, right? We, we build something to be robust, stress, the Chinese source disappeared, but we got stronger. All right. Um, and that was one of the, you know, just to highlight how important it was that if I didn't do that at that time, if I didn't build that our UGL brand, our underground lab brand, right. that that Chinese source disappeared in a month and I would have been done. Yeah, that would have been the end of the business. That's right. it. You're but back to working at the Serendipitously, CR. at the same time that that was happening, I decided that we needed to do something, built a, you know, built this under, underground lab and the business got stronger because of it, because of the whole thing. And, and uh, that, that was serendipitous. But a lot of successful businesses are built on a lot of chances and, and serendipity. So... Um, so then, so now like we, we doubled, we almost doubled our revenue and, and now I can't keep the matrix in stock. Right. So I had to get another chemist. I got it. My shipper was actually became a, an, an Adderall addict and he was, he was, became <laughs> retarded, became absolutely retarded. Like he couldn't, I, so, so this is how the, the, the daily, um, operation went. Uh, I would get the email from the, um, a client, somebody would email me, hey, I want this, this, and this. Okay, here's the payment information. How do you wanna pay? So here's another thing, and I keep jumping around. There came a point when we were making too much money. Now, that's a stupid fucking problem to have, but it was a problem. Right. There's too much money coming in. So this is another thing I did that really just opened up, um, you know, opened up the, the possibilities and allowed us to collect as much money as we wanted. But right now, Western Union uh, only allows people to pick up about twenty thousand dollars a year. You know, we were collecting that a week. Right. So I had to, I had to get an army of people to go out there and collect Western Union. But I'm running out of people. Like it's just a small city, and you know, I had ten people doing it, but that doesn't last too long. We got these what's called green dot cards. You remember the green dot cards? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Daniel didn't know what the hell they were. Oh yeah. Well. <clears throat> So I, like, I had to explain what they were, but yeah. So essentially, just for the people who don't know, it's a uh, prepaid debit card. Yeah. Can you? Ex yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you can. You can. Works. You can load them. You can. So mm -hmm. you can have a a, a green dot card mm -hmm. in your possession, and somebody else can load money on your card from somewhere mm -hmm. else, from like anywhere a Walmart, in the country. Yeah, anywhere yeah. in the country. Yeah. And uh, it's anonymous, right? And so then you can take your card. You can go get money out of an ATM mm -hmm. or or spend it like a Visa. So yeah. you're using all these various cards, all mm -hmm. these various uh, prepaid debit cards yeah. to. And you figured out how to kind of, you got a system, you've yeah. got 30 cards in your own name, you've yeah. got. But yeah, so, so, but it was still difficult to, um, to collect money. We're, yeah. the, so much money was coming in, you can only load these with so much cards that we, that, that we couldn't collect all the money that was coming in. It was becoming a problem um, between that and Western Union. So, so I, I had this problem, I knew I had to fix it. So, so one thing I would always do is, to think is I would go to the gym and you know the gym tends to uh, like a, a lot of the problems with uh, when you're when you're thinking too much and your brain gets foggy or your brain gets foggy when you're doing too much too much research your brain gets fuzzy one of the things that occurs is you you have too many neurotransmitters that are that are completing these synapse firings and um, you're, you're, the firings kind of tend to get crossed. You have too many neurotransmitters in, in your brain. So working out, the mechanical motion of working out actually helps you use these up. And, and then uh, exercise releases a different type of endorphin that, that actually uh, clears your head. Right. People think better, right? Um, so I would go to the gym, and I would always be able to solve a problem when I went to the gym. And I had something in mind. So I went to, my, to the gym on this, and... I remember getting like I don't know, three quarters of the way through the thing and it, and it just hit me like that. Just moment of clarity, it hit me. I can solve this problem. So I heard up and finished the gym and I went home. So what was happening is I was having all of the money from the entire operation come to me and then I was redistributing it to where it needed to go, right? So I thought, well, well the problem is all the money coming to me, right? So what if I just get the money to where it needs to end up? Right. And I just get it there and funnel it all directly from the clients to where it needs to end up. 
and that would that would solve my problem. So I went to the the at this time the Chinese source was still um, was still in uh, in play, and I also had these powder sources that were also from China that we were paying. So I started having clients either send send Western unions directly to the powders. I said, so, and I called them. I, I noticed that these powder sources, I would send, I used to send like, or the, the Chinese source, I would send like $5,000 at a time. That was the most you could send. So right. I would send $5,000 at a time. And they always had different names for me. But there was a lot of people who were only ordering a couple hundred dollars worth of stuff. Right. And, and they, they, there's, they had an endless supply of Chinese names, you know, a lot of Chinese people that collect as much money as they want. Right. So, um, and they would change all the time. So I said, well, can I have my clients send you money and you just keep it in an account for me and I'll just, when I order, I'll just pull out of the accounts. And the, both the powder source and the Chinese source says, yeah, that's fine. Here's a bunch of names, you use them all. So I was able to start funneling money right from the clients. Direct, I just had the clients send it right to China and they would pick up this money and it didn't have to come to me. And they had an endless supply of Chinese names. Uh, so f to pay my employees, I made all of them get these green dot cards or whatever. And I would, the clients would fill up their cards and that's how they got paid. So now all the money is being funneled directly to uh, where it had to end up. Right. And I'm not the middleman anymore. So, um, so now all the money that I'm collecting is just my profit. And it, that, I mean, as, as almost simple as that sounds right now, that was a huge, that, that really fixed a massive problem that was developing. Right. We weren't going to be able to collect money anymore. That's a big problem. Right. <clears throat> and that solved it. That completely solved it. Like their money collection was not an issue anymore. So um, that was actually a big moment. So, so now, now we are, when you become, said to become big like this, the other Chinese powder sources reach out to me to start selling me powders because now I'm spending 200 grand a year on, on powders and the Chinese people want, all want a piece of that. So they, they find out how big we're, they all, they're all pitching us for their powder. So, you know, I have learned to listen to everybody, right? You know, uh, see what other people have to offer. So I took samples, I'll take samples from everybody. So we must've had 50 different suppliers from China send us samples. And at the time, you couldn't have these powders tested anywhere. You couldn't send it to a lab and have these tested. Right. You can do that now. But at this time, you couldn't. That didn't exist. So the way that I took care of it is I started using crowdsourcing. I started using my own clients as testers. And I, I offered them, you know, like discount on, on prices if they would help me out. Clean out their receptors. Um, then... I'm going to send you this vial. I want you to do X amount this many times a week because I know how much that should raise your blood testosterone levels. Then I'll pay for a blood test. You go get a blood test and, and send me the results. So now I can see what each of these powder sources, how much it raised people's blood levels, and I can start to tell quality from that. I must have done this for 50 to 70 sources. And we were able to reduce it all to the, and I was the only one, absolutely the only one doing this. I was able to reduce it down to the top three and I kept the top three that had the most consistent results. And now I had the best powder sources in the entire, not in the country, in the world. I had the highest quality products in the entire world because nobody else did that. And, and our quality, quality was through the roof. This drove in more people, right? So now, I mean, we doubled, tripled again because Matrix is on fire. Like everybody's talking about Matrix and the, and the emails coming in, and I, I heard so much about this matrix, I just got to try it now. Um, so, you know, at the, so now I don't know. By this point, we, we went. I don't know. We're probably making like fifty thousand a week, uh, millions of dollars a year, and um, and it's just taken off like never before. Um, trying to think if there's anything else before the first major crisis. So we're just getting into the first major crisis. Yeah. I guess I can't. Yeah. I can't think of uh, if there's anything else important. I guess I'll have to go back if there is. All right. So the first major crisis. So that. How long does this go on, by the way? What, a year? Two years? This is probably a a year, I guess. About a year, maybe a little longer. A year into it, yeah. A year. Okay. 
So the first major crisis, there's a couple of smaller crises, but they're not really worth mentioning. Um, the, so the first major crisis was, I have to go back to my shipper situation. I had a shipper who became an Adderall a- addict in the freaking, right. he, he was so whacked out of his skull that he couldn't, I gave him, I started to go in this before, so I explained the operation about how it worked. I got in, I got in the emails, I started to do this and I went off on a tangent, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> I got in the emails, uh, people, would give me the order. That's when I started explaining the green dot cards. Now right. how I how I went off. So I got in the orders and I, and I told them how to pay, whether it was green dot or, or anything. Now I don't have to explain that. And um, I would send them the payment information. They would give me back the payment, whether it was the Western Union or a green dot right. or a related card. I would put the money wherever it needed to go, and then put the guy's order into an email. And at the end of the night, I would send the email every night to my shipper who would then head till close of, of the post office the next day to pack everything and get it to the post office. Right. And, and so that was, that was how it worked. And at the, in the meantime, my chemists, at this time I had multiple, were making products daily and shipping it to, um, shipping it to. The, the shipper. Yeah, the shipper. I'm trying to. There was two crises, and I think I, I might be getting getting them misplaced. No, this was this was this was the first crisis. Okay, I thought I was getting them mixed up, and I'm not. Um, he would ship them to the shipper, right? right. So now that's the compartmentalization, and uh, so this shipper would get these emails, and the, he was so whacked out on Adderall that he couldn't. It's put this 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 in this box. Right. It's pretty self-explanatory. Yeah. yeah. Put this in there and send it. And he couldn't do this. He just couldn't do it. He kept screwing up orders. He, uh, he would either he would either put the wrong stuff in the box, or not put the right things, in, or not put in all the items in the box, or send the same items twice to the same person a day apart. I don't know how you don't. Um, so he was. I couldn't use him anymore. He was actually causing problem. Like people were getting, you know, making mistakes. And you know, one of the things that I did that really salvaged this was taking ownership of the screw up and every time he screwed up I would end up correcting the problem and sending somebody something for free so you know people started to actually appreciate when right. they got screwed up because they were getting free products but it was costing me money and then I it, uh, you know and um, it, it you know service was lacking it was being a problem so I had to get a new shipper so I got and again so I can't put take in resumes and put uh, yeah, yeah, you can't. You I can't, can't go, go to on. Indeed. I have like a limited supply of people that I know that I can use, and um, I have to make the best of that. So I had this one guy that I knew. I actually went to, <laughs> that I knew from. I, I actually went. He was on. I was on. We were on parole at the same time, but I actually I had to do a short stint in a rehab, and I met him there, right? And he had done prison time as well, and we. We met at the rehab. We happened to live in the same area. So he was calling, he was asking me for work. And he, you know, was privy to what I was doing and started asking me for the work. And I, you know, at one point, so this guy was a little, he was used to being the man because he ran a pretty big drug operation himself. Right. I mean, it was local. I mean, not, not big, yeah, yeah. how big as I got, but it, it was decent size for, for a local operation. Were you, uh, were you say drug operation? You mean like a um, like like heroin or no, his you mean like steroids? Coke. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. yeah, he didn't know anything about steroids. Okay, but, but um, so so he was kind of used to being the man, right? And and uh, so this is man, there's a lot to explain here. So so uh, another thing I want to go into about is a lot of uh, is the money. I, I keep getting off on these tangents, but I think it's important to understand the mentality that this guy had to. <laughs> For this thing to go wrong, right? So, is that okay, or should I just yeah, stick this through? Yeah, that's that's good. That's uh, okay. So, um, money, right? So, money. A lot of people say, "Well, money, money changes people." And I, I have to explain this to explain the social dynamic change, to explain like his mentality versus versus reality, or, or or what what can go wrong. So, a lot of people say that money changes people, right? Right, and that is true. When you start getting money, it does it changes it does change people, but 
um, it, a lot of times it, it but it also it, it puts responsibility on the person. So 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 when I'm I'm running this operation, or anybody who's running an operation starts ma- making money, uh, m- money is um, secondarily uh, dopaminergic, right? So it, it creates a just dopamine rush in your head, and sometimes you can and you can get not sometimes you get manic over it. Right. And people who don't understand this biochemistry can can um, can let that. Let let that go, and and you can become uh, you know manic, and you th- you start becoming a megalomaniac. You think that that uh, everybody should listen to you, and and you know. So so there's that change, and that's what people mean when they say money changes people, right? right. Um, that certainly happened to me at a point. Um, I was able to reel it in and curtail it at pretty quickly. Um, so, so uh, but. <clears throat> The, the thing I want to highlight is that it also changes the social structure and it changes the people around you. So he was used to, we became friends and he was used to the dynamic where we were equals or he actually always felt he was a little over me. Uh, right. As far as, you know, just, you know, kind of being the little leader of our, of our clip click. Right. So, so he, so now when I have this organization and I'm making all this money and I'm the one who has all the responsibility and now he's below me working for me. Right. And I'm the one with the confidence now, and I'm the one who's the, I'm the alpha male in this relationship. That dynamic shifted, and he was friends with me because of the previous dynamic, social dynamic, right? So now things have changed, and he doesn't like it. Right. So, but this happens with every relationship. So when people say, well, money changed you, well, it changed the, it changes the other people too, because jealousy runs rampant. And if you're friends with somebody because you two are equals, and you can share and relate in, in, uh, in the current dynamics of your life and experiences. And when one dynamic shifts and this person becomes very successful, the person who's left below doesn't like that and no longer there's no re- longer the reasons that that friendship worked in the beginning, right? So this person, jealousy runs rampant, this person becomes angry. And, and so it's the, uh, I just wanna make it clear that everything shifts and the people who get left behind, their attitude shift and they get angry too, right? right. So this is kind of what happened with, with, with him. Um, I was the leader now. I was the alpha male. He didn't like that. He kept trying to tell me how to run this business. And right. I started it all. And he came in just, um, I made him a shipper. And he did come in and do a good job. But he, he felt like he should have half of this company now because he came in and started, was able to put shit in a box and send it to the correct person. Right. Which... He has entitlement issues. Yes, he yeah. had massive entitlement issues. So, um, so and, and some of the stuff that he wanted me to do was just ridiculous. Like, uh, and, and it was not good business practices. And I told him, absolutely not. And I eventually started to have to kind of yell at him a few times. Right. I was like, you didn't, this isn't you. Do your job and shut up. Right. Um, uh, I mean, the guy was making over 100, like 150000 a year now. Right. And uh, he would never be able to make that with, you know, without this. And, and there, instead of appreciation, he felt entitled to more. Yeah. Um, so, so there came a time. So I, um, I started to develop the, the system. Um, so I would be able to step away and go on vacation for a few weeks because um, I like to have extravagant. I had all this money and I had no time to spend it. So it was fun to go out and do something extravagant. So, I taught him how to do the the email so he could he could actually run the entire company right. for the two weeks that I was gone. And although when I'd come back there'd be fires to put out, it still ran okay, and I could put out of the fires and everything would would be fine. Um, so he did that a few times, and I was able to go on extravagant vacation, like you know, kind of go wild, and uh, and then come back and and uh, a week later probably, and and then you know and just take over. So one of these vacations I went to. Uh, Cancun. I went to Cancun for spring break. I was like 32 at the time, and I wanted to go to spring break because I had never been able to do it when I was actually in college because I could never afford it, and right. now I can. So, and we went right where all the college kids were. We intentionally picked all that and, and had an incredible, like an, <laughs> it was it was incredible. It was crazy, uh, you know, VIP tables at all the, these Cancun places every night, and uh, and we got so drunk one night that. We said, why go home after this eight days? Let's go, <laughs> let's stop in Miami on the way back. So we, we, we rebooked our flights and, 
and changed everything and bought new plane tickets for my aunt to stop in Miami. And then we're going to go home in eight more days. So the, and when we woke up in the morning, we didn't remember doing that. We were too drunk. So we woke up and we looked at our phones and we're like, what the hell? Who booked tickets to Miami? And we all, and we all had them and we're like, oh, now we're going fuck, to Miami. I guess we're going to Miami now. Uh, and this is after, a, I mean, drink enough to kill an elephant. Right. So I got, I got from the Cancun, I come into Miami, right? And that, so it's across the border and they have the, you know, people that they, pick some people out to check them for drugs. Right. So um, I come off and I had been drinking, uh, binge drinking for eight days straight. And I actually, I found some, something off of some guy on the beach and I don't even know what it was, but it was pretty good. <laughs> and uh, I was, um, so I was, sh- I come out and I'm shaking and I'm sweating because uh, of you know all the all the yeah, alcohol and some of the you. drugs I did. Yeah. yeah. So the the security guard takes that as I'm nervous. So I'm coming off the plane. He's like, "You, <laughs> get over here. We're gonna check all your stuff." So I go over there and and they're like questioning me. Like they're starting to go through my stuff. I, I'm not dumb. I didn't bring a single thing. Everything was clean. I knew it. So I'm actually having fun with this. And he goes, "Why are you shaking so much? You're sweating." I'm like, "Well, yeah. I drank enough to kill an elephant every single day for the last eight days." And he goes, well, you look like you're going to fall over. I said, I might, but I'll get back up. That's yeah. okay. Um, and they were sure they were going to find something. And I was like, so, and they're searching through everything. And they, um, all my pockets and everything. They're like, I don't see anything. Can we let this guy go? What do you mean, can you let me go? You, I didn't, I don't have anything. Of course you have to let me go. They ended up letting me go. Um, and so I get in, so now we're in Miami. And we get to Miami. It's the same Bacchanal, right? Same, same type of stuff. VI play clubs. Well, at this point, um, I'm running out of money because I've spent a lot of it. So I have to go into the, into the emails, or I tell this guy to start loading my cards. I'm like, uh, I'm like, uh, yeah, can you load my cards? I'm running out of money. I need more money. Oh yeah, by the way, we're gonna be on vacation for eight more days. Uh, can you load my cards? I need money. So um, right about as soon as that happened, as he realized that I was I was looking for money, and I actually went into the emails, grabbed some green dot cards, and told him I took some money. Send me more. Um, he also texts me back. He goes, and the text says, I was trying to wait till you got back from vacation, but I'll, I'm going to have to dump this on you now. Uh, um, I was dropping off some shipments, and somebody was taking pictures at, of me. The cops are watching. I'm leaving. Uh, um, maybe I'll talk to you sometime when this blows over. You know, something like to that effect. And I just like, you know, everything. And I was like, actually that night, I was going to meet a multimillionaire who wanted to talk to me about investing in this business that looked pretty good. So I was going to actually drop a hundred grand into this business. Right. It's something legitimate. And I, so, and I was about ready to go meet this guy. And then this just happens and it, it just takes the window out of my sales and I got to go home right now. And I had to cancel the meeting. <clears throat> so I think that the business is being watched. And, and I go home and I find out that, and I can't do anything for a week. I don't even open my, I'm afraid to open the email. So I got all these guys with all these orders, with all this money and nobody's getting order. Yeah. And nobody's getting any emails or telling anybody anything. So they all start thinking that they're getting scammed and this is just terrible. And I'm at this point, I'm like, the business is done. This is it. That's over. So like, you know, my, I'm just absolutely devastated. Um, I start doing some research. I start to find out just through different things, you know, put pieces together, start realizing that one of the chemists left too. I'm like, why would the chemist leave? And, and it started not making sense to exactly what he was saying. And I started really reaching. I found a bunch of information. And I find out that he was lying. Yeah. He broke off and started his own thing. That's precisely what happened. Except the chemist wasn't necessarily in on it with him. I found out later because I hired the chemist back but it took a while for me to trust him again because it really looked like they were together. He, I don't know. I don't know what happened to this day exactly, but it, it appeared that maybe they weren't together, but, but he did tell the chemist that he was being watched and it scared the chemist and he left, but they went to the same state. They both came to Florida. Okay. Like, this I, is where everybody comes. That's yeah, not, no. That's not necessarily. <laughs> they both came to Florida. <laughs> so, uh, but I find out it, it was, 
it was a lie. And then the, the chemist, so I went back to the powder source because I had another chemist. So now I, he was, the chemist was ordering all the powders. Now I had to go to the powder source and, and get powders for the other chemist because I realized I can start back up that this was all a lie. That right. the, the cops weren't watching. And um, I find out that he had the last set of powders diverted to his address in Florida, which is also very yeah, that's weird, very shady. That's, like, that's why odd. would you why would you do that if you're worried about cops watching us? Right, right? you would right. just leave it with yeah. so you're trying to separate yourself from this. What the fuck are you? Yeah, having this shit. That's exactly right. So it, nothing. It wasn't making sense, and and uh, I find out the guy was lying, and the guy cleaned out all the money. And didn't send a thing for the entire two weeks. So now it's been almost a month because it took me two weeks to find all this information out. And nobody's received anything and nobody's getting any answers. So I finally like had to go back and I started getting back to everybody. And I didn't know if I could recover from this because you disappear for a month. Yeah, yeah, that's an issue. Your trust is gone. Yeah. You know? So I started getting back to everybody. I'm very good with people. I started talking to everybody. Sent everybody what they were owed plus some. Um, got my other chemist working, you know, working around the clock to, to help fix this. I had the old Adderall shipper back, and he, and he helped get uh, give everything back. Um, you know, he was helping. Uh, and eventually we got everybody their orders back. We got, got them extra stuff, apologized. I, I actually was very uh, transparent, and I told him exactly what happened. That my shipper robbed me. He took all the money. He probably robbed me about fifty or $60,000. And um, but we, but I yeah and disappeared, but I fixed it, and uh, and we were able just to keep back. And after a short period of time, it, it actually became that was another thing that became a. Um, people looked at it as as look the serious yeah. thing happened to this yeah. guy. And he still recovered, still sent everybody their yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Gave everybody strength. some free he, stuff. He, yeah, he it turned into a strength. Us. Right. He didn't bullshit us. He told us the truth. Yeah, and then he made up for it. Yeah. He's good. And it turned into something positive. Right. So that was the first major crisis that was averted. Um, okay. Second crisis? Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Second crisis was worse. What? <laughs> <laughs> was that jail time? Second crisis was jail time? Or? No, but it led to jail time. All right. This, so, this is, so the second crisis is what clued the FBI uh, yeah the, the FBI into all right well give it to me uh, into starting to watch or starting to do investigations um okay so I had to yes yeah so after this again I had Adderall shipper back who was terrible right. he was still terrible <laughs> he hadn't fixed his Adderall problem so I had to find more shippers I had a personal assistant because I didn't have time to do anything, like even just shop. So I had a personal assistant who just took care of everything that I didn't have time for. And I paid her, uh, whatever, I, I paid her pretty well, but um, but she wasn't making near the money that the guy's doing the illegal stuff was. Yeah. Well, she, and I didn't tell her what I was doing, and but the problem was that she took care of some things that started to clue her into what yeah, the business was. Yeah, it does Yeah. Drop, you know, collecting money, dropping off some money here. When I, you know, sometimes I just had to have yeah, her yeah. like, and I, I tried not to, tried not to clue her in, but it was just impossible. So, she started to find out what was happening and <laughs> said she wanted in. I want to do one of these things because I want to make more money, over, over hundred grand, like every, like all these other guys. Are. Yeah. So I'm like, oh man, I don't know. Uh, all right, I, I'll get, I'll give her, a sh I'll give her a shot. Okay. Uh, so she, I said, I need a shipper. Uh, so she became a shipper, and she did a pretty good job. Um, so I, at this point, right, I moved to New York, or the greater New York City area. I lived in, um, I ended up getting a penthouse in New Jersey, right on the Hudson, overlooking Manhattan. I had this penthouse, it was a $9,000 a month apartment, which was a lot more back then than it is now. Um, but it was gorgeous. It was, I mean, for overlooking Manhattan, floor to ceiling windows just, just right out over. The, ugh, it was sick. Um, and I moved there, and I'm talking the. I get there, spend one night there. The day I wake up in this brand new, awesome life, <laughs> uh, with my new girlfriend, I get a phone call from this shipper. 
the the post office just called and said that a package was leaking and they had to open it to make sure nothing was leaking or nothing was hazardous. So I'm like, fuck. So, so part of, remember what I said that. So we, had, one of our chemists was out of Georgia. Yeah. So he would pack it up, we'd vacuum seal everything and wrap it all in bubble tape and then ship, ship a hundred vials at a time. Right. And so, but in which, but which a hundred vials in each box and he probably shipped three of them. Right. So it was like 300 vials, probably worth about $30,000. Um, you know, which I didn't think was a lot. <clears throat> we were, you know, uh, we were doing a lot more than that, but, uh, um, but it's an issue if it leaks. It, it, yeah. Well, yeah, if, well did if it really leak? Fun. Like, did it really leak? Well, that's what we, I'm saying. They must have, I mean, I don't know what they could have done to this thing because like I said, everything was vacuum sealed. So even if something breaks, it still stays, the liquid stays in the vacuum seal. Like, and that, that was the point right. of vacuum sealed it and then wrapping it like crazy in bubble tape. I, so they, they, they must have like. Yeah. I don't know, spike this thing on the ground. Or Did something. they ask her to come in? No, so up? they, so. Could you stop by? They were, <laughs> no, so they were like, we're going to open this. She, she's obviously panicking. I'm, I, and I'm in New York and this is upstate. I can't get there. So I call somebody um, to, to go help her. Uh, it was actually one of the chemists to go help her uh, clear out the apartment before the freaking, the DEA gets there. Uh, so they, uh, so they go and they clear out most of the stuff, but they didn't get quite all of it. So the DA gets there and they find like a little bit of, of shipping materials and just a little bit of a product. Most of it was out. Um, but it was still enough to get them the lowest class felony. The lowest class felony is, uh, it, it was just, it, it, the low, the lowest possible felony you can get for possession of a controlled substance. And they would have got... Um, they both were, would have got uh, conditional discharges, which means you're good for six months. It drops off your record. All right. right? So nobody does even jail time. You know, it was, it was a minor, the most minor felony you can get. So, so but, they were arrested. Yes, they were arrested. Okay. And so so they, they showed up while they were still there. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And they, there was a little bit of stuff there. Yeah. Okay. Um, they both got arrested. Like I said, none of them spent any time in jail. And neither of them. There's two of them. And the, the dude knew what was going on, and he just didn't say it a word. Um, they scared the hell out of her right? with the way that they interrogate. You know, you're going to do a lot yeah, of yeah, jail yeah. time. Your whole family's going to jail, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. we're going to take all your kids. Yes. <laughs> we're yeah. going to, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And she didn't have any kids, but they probably told her they're going to take well, her future take, kids. We're going to take the ones you're going to yeah, have. Yeah, that's exactly correct. So she was terrified, and she just, she knew too much from being my personal assistant, right. and she, she was able to put too many dots together, and she blew in the entire operation. Right. Um, the dude shut up, so I paid for a lawyer for him, and, uh, and that was going to be kind of our inside, um, inside into what was going on. Right. Um, so, it, so at this point, it's still the local. It's still, it's a, still state, a state. It's a right. state matter, right? And, and there was only two people in that state operating. The rest of it was out of the state. And I was out. I was in New Jersey. Right. It, I'd also like to point out that I'm yawning because yeah. we were with you until 12 something at oh, night. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So we didn't get to bed until like 1.30. Oh, By like, the time we drove back here. That no, it's not, it and it's, not, it's not you. <laughs> it's, it's the and then, of course, you know, we woke up at like. Mm-hmm. Mm. six or something so we got like text me at like 6 44 a.m right i've been up for an hour or two. i mean it's like it's like this is unbelievable so you did this <laughs> it's not your story so i'm sorry if i if i am mm. yawning it's not you go ahead um so it was the yeah. local cop you said it's the local yeah cop. so it was you still local wanted, it was right. it was state at this point so um so we, we quit you know obviously Oh, you stopped everything. Yeah, we stopped everything. Um, I, again, she, though, she I just had to fill it up. She spilled yeah, she spilled it, everything. Yeah. But they didn't come get you. They no, didn't talk I was to out they of just... the state. No, and, and um, but but I did get a lawyer. I did retain a lawyer, and he talked to them, and they were talking about wanting to interview me because she obviously said my name, and I was like, and we we're like, okay, yeah, we, you know, the the lawyer was just you know advising me, oh, yeah, we'll we'll cooperate. What do you want? Like, what do, you know, what do you have? Like, what do you think he did? Like, yeah. you know, all this, and and they didn't. We'll, the, we'll the fact is, all they had was the testimony of one person. And you cannot yes. arrest somebody on the testimony no, of one no. person. And that's all they had. They didn't have a single other thing. 
<clears throat> right. That operation, that entire operation could be her operation. The one guy's not cooperating yeah, at yeah, all. He's right. not saying anything. Right. She's saying it's somebody else. Yeah. Of course she's going to say it's somebody yeah. else. And of course, like I was terrified at the time, but then, uh, you know, he actually, the, the lawyer actually kind of, kind of started explaining that they, and, and I knew a little bit about the law. I know a lot more now because yeah. in prison, I, I learned, I did my, I did my own case in prison, my own appeal. So I learned a lot about how much they screwed up about my case. Um, but I, even I understood that they, they cannot arrest me over the testimony of one person. So, but you know, we still, we stopped. Again, though, I was terrified to go on. I didn't know if they would be able to watch, but in retrospect, it's it's still hosted outside the country, so uh, so th they can't get all that information. There's just and they didn't have any jurisdiction. And I even found out that I found out later that they tried, they did, they you know they they wanted to get information about it, but they couldn't because out of the state, they have no jurisdiction in other states even right. to go talk to the guy in Georgia because his name came up. To go talk to anybody they didn't have any any jurisdiction to do anything so so we stopped again i didn't want to get on the website because i thought i don't know if there's some way they can figure out my ip address even though i had uh private networks and everything i still i just didn't want to do anything but again now we're to the point where it's going on a month and nobody's getting responded to um <clears throat> And it, you know the business is, is dead again. It's I think it's dead. This is you know this is actually the third time I thought it was I thought it was done. It was just over. Right. Um. So we're sitting there just waiting, just waiting. They 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 said they were going to call me to talk to me, and I was gonna I was gonna go in and talk to them, and it just never happened. Uh, you know, it started to become clear that actually the reason is because they had nothing. They just have nothing. Right. So there's no reason to talk to me. And um, they ended up, these two got felonies. That's all they could do. Right. Uh, um, and, and it was just, it was done. It was done right there. So um, we would, you know, we were talking to the guy's lawyer who I got. And he, uh, he even, so his lawyer was like, it doesn't look like the feds are going to pick this up. He's could that it's like, this is done. This is it. You guys right. got felonies. That's it. It's all, it's all can be done. They don't have any jurisdiction to do anything else. Um, okay. So then all the guys come back to me and said, let's get going again. You know, right. Everybody wanted to get paid. And, and I said, you guys are all okay with this. And they're like, yeah, let's do it. Let's keep going. Okay. Let's start again. So we get back on there. Same thing. Apologize to everybody. Another crisis. Blah blah blah. Uh, uh, paid, you know, made sure I sent sent the orders. There, this time there weren't too many orders that were unfulfilled, but there was a lot of people who, you know, realized we were gone for a month. But it just kind of came back and same thing. Um, apologize to everybody. Took care of the people who who didn't get their orders, and and again it, it all resolved, uh, right back to normal, and if not better. Right. Um, you know, come later. I find out that that this is what so um, at this time they picked up there was a specific tax task force right around this time that was being uh, created to specifically deal with uh, online steroids which was called Operation Cyberjuice. So <clears throat> this yeah Operation Cyberjuice, and that was the operation that you should name that the title Operation. Yeah. Um, that's that's the title of the documentary. So I have oh, really? uh, yeah a guy named Brian Ensign is doing a documentary on our operation, and he's he's entitling it Cyber Juice. Okay. So, um, uh, so they put together. So there's this, there's already this ongoing operation. Yeah. Well, it's just FBI starting to form. Secret Service. Yeah. It's it's a federal operation. Yeah. So FBI. FBI. It's it's headed by the FBI because okay. there's a lot of. Um, and it's just starting to form. Well, it was this freaking post guy, the uh, post master, master who who found it. And I mean, he's just like a, a security. I don't know. I, he was like post post office security, but I mean, he was. But he, you know, he had a federal title, and he was kind of like a top security guy yeah. for the. But I mean, he he really was a cowboy, and he really wanted me because he found this, and like I said, it. It was like thirty thousand dollars worth of steroids. I didn't think it was that much, but apparently it was enough. And this is exactly what that task force was being. So he really pushed this because the feds weren't going to pick it up. And I found out later because he bragged to me about it that he's the one who really pushed this and got this and got the feds to pick this up, pick this case up. Thanks. If he would have just dropped it, it would have been done. But I had to have one cowboy. Yeah. 
<clears throat> so anyways, we started and li you know, little to my knowledge, this, the, like a, probably six months later, the investigation started, but it still took them two more years after they started to, to finally indict us. Um, yeah, but so yeah, I'm trying to think of any pertinent parts before the end. No, I mean, <laughs> w what's what's the end? Like, I mean, do they how, how do they come in and get you? Like, how do they actually get you? So far, it's like they can't do this, they can't do this. Well, then yeah. what changed when the feds got into like what yeah, did they well, get to get to the indictment? And yeah, so the, yeah, the, the feds had more jurisdiction, so yeah, so interestingly enough, uh. They didn't. They still didn't have much information. Right. The, they didn't have enough to actually. To actually, um, I. They probably shouldn't have had enough to indict me. But you know how that goes. It doesn't matter. They can indict anybody. Um, but, but they. Um, and they didn't have enough information that specifically pointed to me or anybody because everything was anonymous. So, for instance, I read. You know, I read when I tore my case apart. I, I read all this. Right. They had. They had a, a, you know, people bought product, and it came to them, and it was real. It, it was tested positive for steroids, but there's it was all anonymous. Yeah, they didn't yeah, have they a person. Know they don't know. Anymore. They there, there's absolutely no proof about who who was. So th about, yeah, who was sending that? So they also had some of the guys picking up um, packages <clears throat> from the post office that had pictures. Now these guys took the packages. Right. And they had pictures, and they're trying to scare people with that. Okay, there's nothing in that package. What is in that package? We took it. Right. You can't prove that there was anything in there. And they didn't. They didn't have – it's not like they opened it first and found out it was in it and then let it go. That's not what happened because that's not they, – they're just – so they're just – they have this, a bunch of half-assed information. And they're, um, you know, and they're just scaring everybody with it. So, so essentially, you know, what happens is – um, they indict everybody and then scare everybody, and then everybody just Starts says, start, yeah, "Everybody just says, well, this is what happened.' Right. And this is, you know, and everybody named me. So, it, so at this point, it doesn't matter um, that they can't. Um, ten people, ten people sitting on the ten stand. people sitting on the stand saying that this this is the guy. That's the guy. Then that's it. And yeah, that's all they need. It's, it's, that's, that's all, all the jury needs. And I knew that. And right. and to be honest, like you know, you know how this goes, right? So the feds try to weaponize your family, every all your friends, and everybody. They'll try to weaponize right. everybody. So so for me. Um, and there was a lot of guys that were tentatively whether or not they're going to plead guilty. So I just was like, you know what, just before you indict anybody else and keep this going, I'm just going to plead guilty. You know, let all these guys be, I, you know, this was all me. So I just, I just came out and said, yeah, I, you know, I did. I mean, I did. And I, I you know, I, I understand that I put myself in a position for the ha this to happen. I did break the law. I knew what I was doing and I'm right. accountable for those actions. And I get that. And I got it. And I just, I just pled guilty and don't, Stop the carnage! So it's all just stop. You got me. Um, so, I have a question. So, what kind of money were you? You were so you were making a ton of money. You're mm -hmm. traveling. Mm -hmm. um, like, I mean, what kind of? I'm just I'm just curious to know. Like, what kind of? Like, are you throwing parties? Are you like what kind of car are you driving mm -hmm. at this point? Like, yeah. So, yeah that that was part of the fun part. So again, so my my prof legacy. Um, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> it means yeah, the <laughs> what the, uh, the ex this spending extravagant oh, okay. wealth and spending like right. extravagant spending. All right, cool. So my profligacy was, and I did, I did spend extravagantly. Because that um, that can also be a, a real hindrance. Like like you know, because now they're looking at you like, look, this guy's making a ton of money, mm -hmm. and he can't account for where this money's oh, coming yeah. from. Yeah, like that's another issue. Yeah. they'll show all those pictures to yeah, the to the jury. Happened. Like these five people are saying. Yeah. You know, he oh, was yeah. in, he was the one running the whole operation. This guy explains exactly how it runs, and yeah. we've got a thought of five hundred photos of him driving multiple yeah, cars. They vacation. followed me on vacations, right? So they had pictures of me, like uh, yeah, <laughs> they have VIP tables and stuff like that. I mean, it didn't. I, again, that's just something that like like it, I mean, you're right, but it all didn't matter because I just pled guilty anyway. So it's like they had all this suit like half-assed evidence that yeah. when all it's aggregated it doesn't yeah, matter. It was they got all, me. Yeah. they got me i knew right. I, I didn't and i didn't try to fight it um what did you end up uh, did you pay did you get a public defender or no i you were, we were able to get a yeah, real lawyer yeah okay. it didn't matter he was terrible well i <laughs> probably worse than the public defender <laughs> um 
So uh, what did you plead guilty to? Uh, possession of uh, possession and distribution of anabolic steroids okay. and international money laundering. All right. International money laundering because of the because wires of, going that's back. That's it. And it wasn't laundering because I was actually just buying products, right? Okay. So later I found out that that is actually against the Supreme Court case, uh, United States versus San- Santos versus the United States. It's like, it goes specifically against that. And the Second Circuit, which is New York, is the only, only circuit that still uh, gives money laundering charges for drug dealers just for buying their products. And it, it's not it, money laundering. That's not money laundering. Yeah, that's right, exactly right, right. correct. And, and no other circuit does that. But, I had, but it, you know what it did is it gave me like two extra years yeah. and it raised my potential maximum from 10 to 20 years. So, so I actually got two more years for this charge that shouldn't have. That trumps up charge that yeah, nobody fucking uses. That nobody uses except for the one circuit I was in. <clears throat> um, so oh, yeah. they, I, so, I, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. So, so you did ask. So, yeah. So I, I want to say that my, I said before, my prof- profligacy was, um, you know, it was well-intentioned. I, like, I, re- I did want, part of what I wanted to do is show a lot of guys who, who are good guys a, a lifestyle that they wouldn't, be able to see on their own right so i did have like an entourage that came with me and um you know any time that somebody was a little short on rent or whatever i would no problem uh you know take care of people and it was important to me to help people and um so you know money is uh money is a it's a, it's arbitrary like money the numbers in your bank account it's all arbitrary right it's an arbitrary creation but it symbolizes our uh uh um, the value that we create it's a symbol of the value that we create for people right so right. Um, but but money is a panacea for all problems you can you can throw uh, wow <laughs> you can throw money and solve problems it's a it's a you know a universal problem solver right, right. you can solve most problems with money so um, so it made it really easy to help people and and I created a lot of value that way like I you know anytime I could help people especially with money I would do that um, and one of those things was that like, I, I benefited from this too, but, um, I, you know, take a lot of people on a lot of extravagant vacations. So, uh, you know, we go to go, I went to my two favorite places were South beach and, and Vegas. And we'd go there and I would just, I would do probably 60 to $70,000, uh, for the, and I, you know, I didn't gamble at all. So it was all on VIP tables and, right. uh, and, and parties. And so one time I brought an entire bachelor party. I wanted to show my friend a good time. Brought an entire bachelor party to Vegas and just that was probably the most expensive one, which is probably around seventy thousand. But it was fun. It was, we had a good time and showed those guys, you know, a night that they'll always remember. Um, so I, I have a question. Um, when the when the police came to get you, mm-hmm. did, did they just knock on your door and say, "Hey, by the way, mm-hmm. we have this issue. We'd like you to come downtown," <laughs> like? I think, I think you know how this goes. <laughs> I think you've been a part of how this before. How did it go? <laughs> I'm wondering where that like. I think, I like, look, I think so you know it. Sorry hey, to look, bother you. I know it's a Saturday. Possibly, possibly our fault here, but I just have a couple questions. Yeah, uh, that's not how it happens. No, shockingly, surprisingly. It was so, a letter. It was like a certified letter. <laughs> you have to. Can so, you please be here on Monday morning? <laughs> so I was uh, just got back from an extravagant Vegas trip, and I was hungover. And I was just like in bed. I hadn't been able to move for a couple of days because it was pretty. Uh, it was pretty a lot of fun. So I'm, I'm uh, in bed. It's five o'clock in the morning, and all of a sudden I hear this pounding on the door. And I just kind of wake up. I just almost don't believe what what I just heard. And um, my girlfriend gets up. The dogs start going nuts, and they go out to the door and are barking. And um, uh. So I, I get up and I'm just like, what? And I'm starting to kind of put some clothes on. My girlfriend actually went out and went out to the door. And then again, I hear pounding on the door. Now I'm getting angry. I'm like, who the hell, hell no. who the hell is pounding on my door? I'm about to go tell this person yeah. about what they should be, whose door they should be pounding yeah. on at this you time. Do you know who I am? <laughs> we actually do know who you are. So I threw on some clothes and I go out there. And my girlfriend is coming back from the door. She didn't open it. And she says, they have the people blocked. I don't know who's out there. And I'm like, oh, yeah? <laughs> I'm, I'm mad. I'm angry. I'm going to I'm gonna go show this person something. I go in there and I rip open the door. 
And there is about 15 people with bulletproof vests on and guns pointed at my head. And Wrong I just, <laughs> yeah, it's like, you want the guy down the hall. Yeah. You're looking for who? <laughs> oh my God. You're in this luck. This happens all the time. <laughs> You're in luck. I know where he is. <laughs> uh, so the, so the first guy was that damn post, post office and or, I don't know, postal employee. by the mail. That freaking That's mailman got me. And he, so he puts his hand on the door and he says, I remember it's clearly, it's vivid. He says, he just goes, okay. And that okay was for two things, right? It was for all the people behind him because I'm not, I don't have any guns. I'm not violent. Um, and he was kind of saying, okay, you know, everything's okay to them. So they all kind of lowered their weapons when he said that, right? And then, uh, but he also was saying, okay to me, okay, we got you. It's done. So they, they took me in. My girlfriend and I took us in, handcuffed us, put us on a stool. And um, some lady goes, do you know why we're here? I said, I have no idea why you're here. <laughs> I knew why they were there. I did. <laughs> this is cr- clearly this is a mistake. <laughs> yeah. This is a case of mistaken identity. This I, must happen to you guys a lot. I work <laughs> at the ER. <laughs> that was like two or three years ago. I, make, I clearly make $270 a week. Yeah. Um, and so that, that was another thing that actually finally gave me a little solace. For some reason, this gave me solace, is that the, the, uh, the FBI agents, um, w- like, they couldn't help themselves. More than one did. It would come up to me, hey, this is an incredible place. I had, <laughs> I had this floor to sing with overlooking Manhattan, a big screen TV right in the thing, and uh, uh, the place was sick. Um, and they, but two of them, at least two of them, had to tell me that. And, yeah. then, they're, and then all the cops sit on my couch, and they're watching my TV. Well, while some of them are in there, like searching, you know, searching everything, and then they took me down. And I didn't even spend the night in jail. I got put right on pretrial immediately. Nice. And, uh, I yeah. was gonna say, do you know why we're here? My <laughs> girlfriend's running a, a <laughs> running a steroid <laughs> ring. That's <laughs> probably why you're here. I'm assuming, honey. <laughs> they're here for you. Is there something you want to tell me? <laughs> uh, I can't believe it took you guys this long to get her. So that was that was about it. <laughs> that was it. So and so, how long before you were uh, you were sentenced? I mean, you get yeah, the lawyer. The lawyer's terrible. like. So was it the same lawyer? You get the same lawyer and yeah, you walked in and guy. said, "I thought you said I had nothing to worry about." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It felt like I <laughs> thought that. Yeah, it was the same lawyer. I, I had yeah, I kept the same lawyer throughout the whole thing, but it wasn't the lawyer that said that that there was nothing to worry about because right. that was the guy the lawyer I hired from. For them, for the other oh, okay, yeah. So you got another lawyer for this. And well, you but it was the same one I retained for that incident. <clears throat> Did you, I still had him retained? Right. Did you? So and you, you, uh, proffered and pled guilty. Yeah. Right. He said this is a good deal. Yeah. <laughs> like, and, it, and it was not. Right. <laughs> um. Yeah, I really went to bat for you. Yeah. Uh, I'm yeah. friends with the judge. I got. Yeah, I got <laughs> you. It's gonna be okay. I, I was able to get you more time than you should. Yeah. <clears throat> right. But don't worry. I'm going to talk to the judge. We're friends. Yes. We play golf together. That's actually together. what happened. That's it. He actually oh, told I, me that. He told me that he knows the judge. He goes to lunch with him all the time. Yeah. And that's <laughs> part, that's part of the problem. You do <laughs> understand. Apparently, every single defense attorney out there well, takes the judge to lunch or yeah, plays yeah. golf with them because yeah. they. T- I'll tell you that. So this is part of the problem. So I did, when I was in prison, I did a lot of research on prison reform and and part of the problems. And and one of the major problems is that the, is the, the brotherhood that exists. So the, what happens is um, you'll have a judge, you get out of law school, you clerk for a judge, right? Right. Then you become either a, a prosecutor, the defense attorney, or, or you become an attorney. Right. Well, they've all worked together. Yeah. They all they all try not to step on each other's toes. And there's a brotherhood. They all stick together. So your attorney is is working not really for you, but to make sure he maintains this brotherhood and maintains this relationship because he because everybody wants to keep it cordial between each other. And he's not necessarily working for you. Right. Um and the judge just sits there and defers to the defense attorney because again, they're buddies. And the, your attorney is really not pressing any issues because, again, he doesn't want to piss off the judge or even the defense attorney. Right. 
Uh, it's a brotherhood, and that's yeah. it's part of the problem and what something that needs to be changed with prison reform. So, so you you went to prison, and um, you did legal work. You helped guys with legal yeah, work. Yeah, so I became yeah. So I was doing my own case, uh, my own appeal because. I, real, I started to realize, I started looking at it and realize how bad of a job my lawyer did. And I just found all kinds of errors that should have got, gotten me about two and a half years less. Right. And then, <clears throat> so then, uh, you know, because I did that, I also cognizantly thought about how can I create value for myself within this community of people that I'm in, within this new society, to, you know, um, to, to get uh, uh, appreciation, you know, respect and appreciation, which will make my time easier yeah. right? if, if I'm respected. So I had already started doing legal work for myself, and I thought, well, everybody here can use legal work. So I just started helping other people, and I did it for free, and I got a big name for that. And I, because I started doing it every day for almost four years, I became really good at, at legal work, and I became the man to go to for the, the jailhouse lawyer, and I helped a lot of people out of uh, right – habeas corpus petitions, uh, motions to the court, and defend prison. You and I know the word shots, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, most yeah, people yeah. don't know that. So and, any prison uh, disciplinary, disciplinary actions. actions, I would defend people. And, uh, and everybody knew when, they ha- when something happened, you come to me. And, and I got a lot of respect for it. It made my time a, re- a lot easier. But um, I forgot, forgot what led to all that. But yeah. <laughs> well, what would you do your time? Where? Yeah. Uh, I was first sentenced to Otisville camp. I just went to camps because I'm nonviolent. Yeah. Otisville camp, and then I transferred to Cumberland for RDAP. RDAP is a program, drug, residential drug abuse yeah, yeah. program that gets you a year off your sentence. Yep. Did you, like the dr- did you like the drug program? I did. I did. So when I was there, you know, you're surrounded. That was a new place I had to go to, so I had to create value for myself again in a mm-hmm. new place. And, um, again, it was with the legal work, but – um, because it's a drug abuse program, it was almost full of drug dealers, almost everybody, yeah. right? So, you know, it's... Or a, drug addicts. Right? Yeah, but it's, it was mostly dealers, but yeah. because drug addicts don't go to federal prison usually. It's usually, yeah. well, it's usually the dealers. Yeah. They do if they sell a, like a $10 crack rock and bring a gun. Yeah. yeah. Now. That'll, that will do it. <laughs> now you got a rock. Yeah, that'll do it. For some um, reason, you now need to go to federal <laughs> prison. It's like, wait, you know... Pookie's kind of an idiot and really should be in state <laughs> yeah. prison or just maybe or, yeah, or, or, or yeah, maybe county, a mental institution county or maybe just a drug rehab <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're why do right. I have to be his monkey yeah that's exactly correct and that happens a lot yeah so and yeah one of the things I learned after helping so many people with their cases is that and if you read Dermina shot what's his name Sean Lawler is that his name uh the lawman uh the guy who the guy who was in prison, uh, who got two, three Supreme Court cases yeah. seen by him, Sean yeah, yeah. Waller, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, Cerceri's. Um, uh, yeah, he was locked up. He was the bank robber. He yeah. did a bank robber. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's he's now a at Georgetown. He's a professor, a yeah. law professor of law at Georgetown. Um, but he, yeah, there was he like had, a 60 while he was in prison, he had like three Supreme Court cases, which is unheard of, yeah. even for a lawyer. Yeah, no, for guy, lawyers that are thir- yeah, he was just a guy in 30 prison. years have never get, yeah. yeah. So, um, and, and he, so he said the same thing, that, and I read his book after I had already noticed this, but most people are overcharged and oversentenced. Almost, right. a, almost I'm going to say 80 to 90% of the people in prison, in yeah. federal prison, I can't speak for state, but I'll speak for federal, are overcharged and oversentenced. And that's because of the dynamic of the whole system about how they throw everything at, at you that they can. Mm-hmm. and Give you a lawyer that doesn't want to fight he, for that's you. That's exactly right. And a judge who doesn't really care. Yeah, he doesn't give a shit. And, Make um, it $350. And they're all working together. So, so it, it sticks. Um, and, you know, because the incentive is convictions, right? right. The incentive is only is convictions, and if the more convictions you get, you move up. Right. So they're not doing it for justice; they're doing it That's for that exactly correct. And, and it's they not, sleep it's like a baby real. at night. Yeah. So this guy should probably go to go to rehab. Instead, I'm going to give him 15 years, yeah, and I it sleep happens like a, all the time. I'm going to sleep like a baby tonight, and yeah. on my three thousand um, dollar ceiling posturpedic. Yeah. And uh, and feel like I I actually did society yeah, and, and, justice. Yeah. And convince yourself that you that you're doing. Right society a favor yeah yeah and it happens yeah. all the time and these guys aren't bad guys i spent i spent a lot of time with these and these guys aren't bad guys they're not trying to hurt anybody you know it's um 
another part of prison reform is that what I noticed a large part of the problem is that people don't know what else to do, right? You grow, you grow up in a certain culture and you, you see people making money. These are the people that you're seeing that are successful yeah, that you, that you want to emulate. That. Product of environment. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, exactly Your correct. mother's and, a drug dealer. Your father's been in fucking yeah. prison your whole life. Your, your, your two cousins are drug dealers. Your uncle's a drug dealer. Yeah. You're, everybody across the board, drug, the only people you know that are making money are drug that's dealers. That's exactly correct. You know? And school isn't an option because nobody really understands it. And, and you know, well, if and you anybody don't, that's doing well in school gets out of the neighborhood immediately. Yeah, right. Yeah. Or other, everybody makes fun of him. Yeah. He's Urkel. He's yeah. a geek. He's this. He's mm -hmm. not cool. You know. Yeah. And because, because they didn't grow up in, a, in an environment that embraces school, it's not an option to them. It, right. it, like, you know, people who grow up think, saying, oh, you have to go to school, you go to college, you get a job. Well, that's nobody's not, tell, but nobody's telling nobody's them that. Nobody's telling them that, yeah. right? So you get all these guys and they, they only know one thing. They don't know what else to do. So that's what prison needs to fix, right? It needs to fix, let me show you, teach you something else to do. And it does a terrible job of that, yeah, a terrible job. I was they, a tutor, you were a tutor. I don't see they're and, to and there's, anybody that. They don't, there's no, there's, bare ass programs that are just there for optics yeah. that don't really that don't actually try to teach people anything right but if you could put in incentives you reduce your time if you learn this skill if you learn how to become a plumber or a ac tech or, or right. something you learn a different skill we'll incentivize it by reducing your time i guarantee people will be in the books and and learning something else to do they need something people need something else to do I always say um, that everybody should have to take RDAP. Yeah, I agree across with that. The board, or yeah. some sort because it's you know it's really not about drugs. You know, it's, yeah, it's 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 about human behavior. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's it's total um, uh, behavior modification, yeah. and, and it's it's such a great program. Yes, like I feel I like I I've mm -hmm. learned so much in RDAP. Yeah, yep. um, and Jess is the same way. She's mm -hmm. like I, I she feels like like it's definitely was a yeah it was definitely worth it. Yes, um, unequivocally. You know, uh, even it, here's the thing. Even to the guys that were like, oh, I'm faking my way through it. You know, even it doesn't matter. Yeah, it, yeah. it doesn't matter. You, you learn something. You pick up on that stuff. You, yeah. you probably, the recidivism rate from even the guys who really weren't taking it seriously yeah. probably helps reduce the recidivism yes. rate for those people. Because yes. you being in the environment, you have to pick up on something. Yes, yeah, agreed. And you'll learn something about yourself. Mm -hmm. But um, so, but you got out, um, what, how many months ago? Like, Yeah, I was released from the BOP in January. Okay, uh, and now you're you're working. What are you doing now? So now, so I t I took all the. So this becomes a story of redemption, right? So I aggregated a lot of knowledge uh, with what I did. I, I used to guide people through uh, through hormone uh, hormone treatments, right? Um, it, it, you know, on the order of like I was taking in like 500 emails a day and I was guiding like 100, sometimes 200 people a day by looking at blood work, uh, uh, looking at pictures, you know, figuring out some symptoms and, and really fine tuning to get people to look exactly how they want to look and feel exactly how they wanted to feel. And I did this on the order of 20,000 people. Um, that's more than any endocrinologist or, or, uh, endo or urologist, which are the people who are supposed to deal with, the, with these hormones, with, but they're terrible at it. Um, more than more than any of these official medic, you know, the medical community, uh, I, in the United States, right. I have more experience than almost anybody in the United States, and I'll say it more than anybody. Right. I've just dealt with it on such a vast level. I've ag aggregated so much empirical data um, that, you know, I, I wanted to, so I wanted to take this, you know, this skill I have and make it legitimate. So again, it's a story of redemption. I started my own TRT clinic, a testosterone replacement therapy or hormone replacement therapy clinic. And I partnered with physicians, um, and um, so now I can help you know help people with. And, and now I'm concerned about safety and health, but still trying to you know utilize hormones to get people to feel better, to improve their quality of life because it dramatically improves people's quality of life. With the with the the idea of safety and health, keep you within this, the health, the health markers and um, in range, right. So our, my website is called uh, hormonesforme.com. Right. Okay. Um, and and we'll, uh, I'll put it in the description. We'll put, make sure Colby puts it in the description. Okay. Uh, I, in the description box. And But you also have a YouTube channel. Yes, I do. I have a YouTube channel. Um, 
which you just started. I just started, right? and it's pretty bad <laughs> for well, now, but well, it'll get no. better. Yeah, it'll get better. Um, it's called Memoirs of a Steroid Kingpin. All right, and we'll put that in the description also. I appreciate it. I also do a regular, um, a, I, I'm a regular on a, a an industry specific YouTube channel called the Danny Bosa Podcast. Right. We we talk specifically about hormone opti- optimization and testosterone. Does Colby have therapy. that one too? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then what about the the book? You have a you have a book that you're in the process of writing, but it's being released chapter by chapter by chapter. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. So it's um called the Serialized Chapters. Um, you can find it on if you if you just Google Memoirs of a Steroid Kingpin, it will. It, it will pop up the first ones or uh, the link to Amazon Kindle, Kindle Vela. Okay. And there's another platform, Frictionate Me, that um, is another platform on which it's available. Hey, I appreciate you guys watching. And do me a favor and hit the uh, like button. Uh, subscribe to the channel. Hit the, uh, hit the bell to be notified of videos like this. Leave me some comments in the comment section. I try and respond to as many as I possibly can. And... You know, I do that several times a day. I go on and answer uh, questions. Also, if you want to email me, my email uh, will be in the uh, in the description also. And I have a Patreon if you want to support the channel. And I also, uh, you know, also have paintings. Everything you see here is available. So I appreciate you guys, and I'll see you.